Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for coming along to this event concerning military pollution in uh, non-war zones. So basically, military pollution in peacetime. I have organised this along with the, the Honourable Member, Mr Yelko Kachin. I thank him for his uh, help. He's going to be our first speaker. And I'd also like to thank uh, the other rapporteurs. So I'd like to give a, a brief introduction in order to explain how we're going to organise the afternoon. The afternoon will be split into two parts. We're going to have two different panels. And first of all, we'll be dealing with the present situation in uh, these uh, places. We'll be dealing with this very sad business of the pollution of these sites. And then later we'll be looking at various well-known locations such as the uh, the Aquira base in Sardinia and then during the uh, second panel we'll have some different speakers coming up to the front and we'll be talking about the uh, the, the future of these polluted uh, territories what uh, what future the future prospects will be for these uh, locations that have been uh, polluted. And I'd now like to introduce the speakers. As I was saying earlier, uh, we'll start with a speech from Mr. Jelko Kacin, who is a Slovenian member of the European Parliament from the Liberal Group. He is my uh, group colleague. We've worked very hard together on all sorts of issues. And after that, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Marco De Dola, who is an Italian journalist from the Rai News uh, channel. He's providing uh, a lot of... Uh, very useful information and trying to, to ensure freedom of the press in Italy. We talked often in this room about um, freedom of information, freedom of the press. We've talked about the situation prevailing in Italy. We've talked about the situation that uh, unfortunately prevails in other countries such as Hungary. We talked about the problems related to lack of press freedom. So we know what, uh, what it means, unfortunately, when uh, there is a restriction on information that's available. And then on my left, uh, uh, Professor Gatti, who's a, a, a lecturer at the University of Modena, and she's a, a nanopathologies expert. And then uh, we'll give the floor to Augusto Di Stanislao. He uh, sits on the Defence Committee in the Italian Chamber of Deputies. And then uh, alongside Mr. Kachin, we have Mr. Pepino Fani, who is the uh, Provincial Secretary of uh, the uh, Trade Union Chisel. He'll be talking about the situation of workers uh, working in the firing ranges. Having made that brief introduction, we will then hear from the other rapporteurs. We'll be, as I say, moving on to a second panel of rapporteurs. And, and but uh, but anyway, now I'll ask Mr. Kachin to take the floor, and thanking him again for for his willingness to help us. Thank you, Yelko. Grazie, Gio Maria, cari amici, benvenuti. Thank you very much, dear friends. You're very welcome. Due to the fact that I don't speak all the languages of our neighbouring countries. But I'm glad that you came here uh, in such a big number because the question we are going to discuss today is extremely relevant and it might become even much more relevant in a very near future. I would just like to remind you on recent discussion 
between American President and Israeli Prime Minister about the eventual development of nuclear weapons in Iran and eventual action to prevent developing these kind of weapons in Iran. Despite we are discussing about the pollution close to the military, uh, let's say, depot or military facilities, what might be a consequence of any kind of intervention would be a worse spread pollution between Israel and Iran and everything in between. So this is a relevant challenge and we simply need to be very, very, very rational when we discuss these kind of topics. When we talk about the pollution and the consequences of pollution, I would like to remind you on one horrible accident that was happened quite close to Italy, namely in Albania a few years ago, when they were trying to dismantle military depot and uh, they were trying to achieve uh, final objectives with the minimum of investments. That's why they used children to participate in these activities, to clean up this depot and to dismantle, dismantle heavy artillery. When the explosion appeared, the devastation was enormous. I don't want to talk just about the victims, about the uh, material consequences. I just want to talk about the shock and the consequences of uh, this event uh, on a society where it happened. I want to say that very often we are behaving like we are in a stone age, you know. Despite that, we are confronted with sophisticated, sophisticated military. On one hand, there is everything in the, in the aircrafts, including uh, laser designation, night Googles, but before landing, they just drop bombs somewhere in Mediterranean, in this case, somewhere in Adriatic. Uh, years after, we are still confronted with the same problems, and uh, when we talk about the pollution, we cannot just discuss the problems that we still have in my country, in River Socha, Isonzo, in Italy, as a consequence, as a relict of the First World War, and Caporetto and everything that you know about that. But believe me, in my country, we still collect more than 10 tons of ammunition per year on these locations. And it is almost 100 years ago. So we simply need to admit that there is a pollution spread all over the globe. And due to the fact that in Europe we have had so many military confrontations, I simply need to say that we are amongst the most polluted parts of the world, despite we ignore that. So this is a very, very relevant issue. A few weeks ago, two weeks ago, maybe uh, a day or two more, I was in Libya, where the situation is completely out of control. Not just because uh, there was enormous devastation and around these military depots, there is a lot of pieces, small bombs, cluster bombs that are dispersed around. But there is another problem, there is no structure in Libya. I believe that you know much better than we, the other Europeans, are aware of that, that there is no administration, there is no system, there is no control, there is just nothing but a lot of ammunition on differ of different kinds, including chemical weapons, without any kind of control. Just sun is controlling what is happening below. Because of that, I believe uh, this decision uh, to organize this conference is a very relevant one, should be welcomed, and uh, especially due to your very specific and very concrete experience and problems, challenges, uh, not just uh, on the continent, but on the islands of Italy as well, 
I simply believe that we need to point out how important it is, and I'm quite sure that uh, this today's discussion will really contribute very much to spread awareness about the importance of this challenge, and first of all, responsibility to delete it from reality, to cope with that and to reduce the dangers that are connected with that to the minimum. We can never eliminate it 100%, but we should pay efforts to eliminate it by 110%, because in reality, there will be still more and more surprises, and we will still be confronted with the civil victims of war, out of war zones, and out of war time. This is a reality of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yelko. And now we're going to move from the Balkans to Italy, and I'll give the floor to Marco De Dola. I'll pick up the last words from Mr. Kacin, reality and responsibility. I think that those are two very important words, and they might be a, a light motive uh, for our presentations today. So I'm very happy to give the floor to Marco De Dola. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak uh, Italian. Now, uh, before I forget, when... Uh, uh, you you speak in English. You just need to, if you want to listen to the Italian interpretation, you turn your button to four. Or you, so if you want to listen to Italian, it's on channel number four. But well, I'll be speaking in Italian, and I'd like to start with a quote, a rather literary quote. And we'd also start with an image. Uh, I don't know how... Well, I, I think it's very down-to-earth, but, but basically I'm talking about something that happened at the beginning of the 30s, in the last century, and Elio Vittorini hadn't yet become a well-known uh, writer, which he became after the Second World War, travelled to Sardinia. He, he didn't uh, have much money. He, car he, he, he's, uh, he carried that lovely trip... Uh, he went from he 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 went through the whole of the island. Uh, he went across the sea, then into uh, into, Cor into Corsica. He used a post postal boats. But as I was saying, these were the in the thirties. It, it, it was the full period of uh, fascism at the time. And despite the fact that we'd had the novels of Grazia de Leda, who became a Nobel Prize winner in those years, uh, Sardinia was still a relatively unknown island. And uh, Elio Vittorini was attracted by this unknown island. That, now, this book, which isn't easy to find, uh, is called uh, uh, Sardinia Like a Childhood. You can find it. And... The title comes from the fact that he discovered this very wild and lonely island, and and it was a happy island as well because he he felt that the island was at the dawn of its history. And that was how the writer Elio Vittorini saw it. But of course, in reality, in the thirties, Sardinia was already Sardinia was already quite a complicated island, more complicated than uh, Vittorini thought. But anyway, I'd like to go back to my image. Uh, halfway through his trip, I won't say where, but it could even well be in uh, Quira, but probably not, uh, Elio Vittorini came uh, across someone on a, on a beach. He was a customs official. We never find out anything more about him, but he spends his time on this beach, not doing anything in particular. And here uh, Elio Vittorini writes, and this is my quotation, he was the king of all he saw. And, uh, and, and I can understand it because for a long time, Sardinia was a, a long uh, uh, time uh, when anyone, for a long time, anyone could come to Sardinia and call themselves a king of all they could see. Like anyone could come along and declare themselves king. Now, when I read this book and I was young, I was very struck by this uh, sentence and, and it keeps coming back to me. 
and it's true, uh, Sardinia has already be, always been a land that people have tried to conquer. Whoever turned up in Sardinia, whoever arrived there, tried to grab a piece of the land, tried to build their own kingdom. Uh, of course, nowadays, people buy a holiday home and come just for three weeks a year. But they feel as well that they've uh, built themselves a kingdom, like the uh, the kings of, the, uh, of Savoy, who became the kings of Sardinia in the 16th century. So this sentence, you know, becoming a king of all you can see, is, has, a, has a historical backdrop as well. But, but I'm applying it to this person, this customs official. Who is he? Where does he come from? What's he doing on that beach? And uh, if you haven't read the book, you can start dreaming about this man. But I've got to stop because uh, I'm the first speaker and, and I've got to give you some uh, figures and facts which relate to our subject. But I will come back to the customs official. Uh, I will make some comments about him. But anyway, I get the the news on the on the web. Uh, uh, just like anybody, I surf on, on the web and I, and I find out a lot about Quira. This information is available publicly. Perhaps some people could call into question the information that's on the web. But anyway, I, I can tell you which website I got the information from and you can correct it if necessary. But I can read out uh, the fact that this, there's this experimental... Um, firing range in Salto di Quira, an interforce firing range, and it is uh, run by the by the, by a, a commander. And we have here the, the Quira land firing range, and, and there are various other brigades there, detachments, and there is also a sea uh, firing range at sea. And there, there are staff from, well, 50% of the staff come from the Air Force, and uh, the firing range has all the necessary equipment so that you can try out an experiment uh, on, with, on rockets, missiles, planes and radio targets. No, but the, this uh, firing range has a long history. Uh, I've been looking into it since, uh, it, since, uh, since the 1950s. But in Quira, uh, not, not many know people, this, but the, the father of uh, Italian airspace science worked there. His name was Luigi Broglio. And in fact, in Quira, and it will be interesting to know how many people who live in this area know this, it was in Quira that recently there was a, a test. There was a trial just a couple of years ago of the of the, the jet fuel and the jet fuel to be used by the Vega launcher. This is the grandson of the original creation of Luigi Broglio, and it's the most recent miracle of Italian airspace industry. And this uh, this is this uh, this has helped launch satellites as recently as February. There isn't just the Vega launcher. There's in Quira as well. That also there was a test carried out on the Ariane uh, French rocket, a French or European rocket. Ariane was tested in Quira and it's able to launch heavy satellites into space, which are used for uh, television uh, and, and television and tele telecommunications and for mobile phone use. But anyway, this sort of tests, uh, these sort of tests are not bad. Obviously, they're quite useful. We all use uh, the TV. I actually work in a, for a TV station. We all have mobile phones. We need these satellites. But now I'd like to come back to the customs official, the uh, man I started with. What, what is Quira? Quira is a place where strange things have been tested as well, strange and dangerous things, but also useful things. But it's also a military firing range and a military... Uh, firing ground and the tests for that reason are often secret first of all weapons are tested and as often happens or very often happens in these cases there is complete secrecy for decades about these tests we in the press have been looking into these things not too much but at least, at least a little soon you'll see uh, an, another inquiry into this and 
and there has been talk of Luigi uh, Bro Broglio when he was working in uh, Quira, but he was talked about in the press um, because of what he what he did in Kenya. There was a, there was a launch site in uh, Kenya, and in fact, it's, this year is the 50th anniversary of the uh, the opening of that launch site in Kenya. It's not really a firing range, it's a launch pad, a launch site. And anyway, then there were whispers about people getting strange diseases. First of all, animals fell ill, but then later people fell ill. And then uh, the most recent thing we've seen in the, the press is that there are lots of, um, there's a lot of suspicion. There are also legal uh, investigations. And in fact, the, it's very good that there are these legal investigations and a lot of accusations are being lodged. And I can also now quote again from Wikipedia. This is information that's again public, available to the public. There's a possible crime being has, has been uh, committed because certain uh, d diseases have occurred in the area and also um, civil workers on the basis, uh, the, uh, members of the military, shepherds um, who are grazing their flocks in the area uh, have all fallen ill. People living in local villages have fallen and in and the, so the 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 press have now uh, christened this uh, this disease the Quira syndrome and apparently one of the commanders of the base actually has passed away because of a, a lymphoma now I don't have the skills I I can't uh, prove whether it's, it's it's linked to the use of depleted uranium other people who are more skilled than I am will talk about this and the, the possible causes but anyway the, the judges are involved the courts are involved and I think it's up to the, the courts to decide exactly what happened but I want to talk about this a customs official described by Elio Vittorini. Before that, uh, a few words about the media. I, I work in, you know, for a TV station. Uh, my TV station has uh, dealt with this matter and has actually launched accusations. And here I'd like to talk about two people, Sigfrido Ranucci and uh, Maurizio Torialta, two of my colleagues, I'd like to mention their names, but now I'll um, come to a conclusion when it, when, and talk about my customs official, the king of the beach, who he is, where he comes from, we'll never know. And perhaps he was just dreamt up by uh, Elio Vittorini. But I, and I'm, I'll ask other people who are Sardinian like I am, I'd like to know uh, uh, whether they can whether, whether you can imagine what it's like to be a foreigner. For me, that the customs official wasn't a, a Sardinian. We Sardinians are rather proud, proud, and we would have called him uh, an Italian from the mainland, a mainlander. Uh, we, and I, I, but I, I uh, have emigrated from when I was young, but, but I remember... Uh, the, the the civil servants who arrived in Sardinia who arrived from the mainland to work uh, to work on the island. We never knew where they came from exactly in Italy. But the problem is that, that a, a Sardinian king, uh, or perhaps just uh, the king of a, of a of a small beach somewhere. Well, I just can't imagine this person. I don't know this person, but perhaps this king lives on that beach, on on that uh, cliff. Uh, um, perhaps works there. Uh, perhaps kills himself working. But that that small person doesn't actually reign. Doesn't reign over all he uh, sees. So there's a, there's a le there's a there's a lack of sovereignty. Uh, the, the, the Sardinians actually haven't been masters in their own home, haven't been kings of all they can see. And so there is a lack of uh, democracy, a lack of uh, sovereignty in the Europe of peoples. I think it's the people that should be sovereign, and that's not been the case. And and, and, and there's, there's a lack of sovereignty in Quira, there's a lack of sovereignty in the whole of Sardinia. And if we look further afield, in other parts of Italy, and I could mention some others, in Sigonella Avion, uh, Aviano, Camp Darby, between Pisa and Livorno. Perhaps these areas are not uh, in such danger. Uh, but, but, so, but, so, but we hear whispers that 
nuclear weapons have been kept in some of these places, but we we don't know. We don't know what's happened in, in Sigonella. We don't know what's happened in Aviano. But then we can perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps we could go to the, in the other direction and go to Trino, Vercellese, go to Casale, Monferrato, where there is no military secrecy, but nonetheless people are dying. And in Casale, in Casale, Monferrato, where people were attracted by the, 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 the fact that there was there were jobs and people shut their eyes to the dangers, but they were then exposed to asbestos, and uh, that, that's a sort of test case, really. And then, of course, there's the history of the 60s and the 70s in Casale Monferrato. And what we see is a loss of sovereignty, people losing sovereignty over their own bodies and over their own health. But recent history, without uh, talking about the whole Eternit uh, case and, and trial, that can be uh, the sort of example we could follow to to get back not sovereignty entirely but to, to get to get to get back some some sort of mastery of one's own land uh, i haven't lived in sardinia now for, for several decades but i would like sardinians to have a mastery of their own lands that's the sort of that's what they should be trying to get back and we as workers of the, in the media uh, we as reporters and journalists uh, we have to we have to provide information People should give us information and we'll pass it on. We That's our job. So, and now I'd just like to uh, show you, uh, and I'm afraid I have to show you a clip, a video clip, and there won't be any interpretation I'm for technical reasons. But anyway, you'll get a, a three-minute video clip of one of our investigations into Quira. You'll see some sites uh, striking images. Okay, so let's, let's start. Let's start. Non vengono vaccinati. Gli agnelli non puliscono le munizioni. O molto recenti, recentissimi del gruppo di lavoro cui appartengo, abbiamo provveduto all'analisi delle ossa di questo agnello teratologico, di questo agnello malformato. E abbiamo trovato l'evidenza della presenza all'interno di queste ossa di uranio e non solo di un rapporto isotopico fra uranio 234 e uranio 238 non compatibile con la presenza di uranio naturale. Questo non in Iraq, questo non in Libia, questo a de scala plano. Forse ci potremmo addirittura fermare qua. O vediamo i titoli di testa. Un agnello nato con due teste, nelle cui ossa sono state trovate tracce di uranio non naturale, potrebbe confermare l'ipotesi che tra Perdas de Fogo e Quirra siano state utilizzate. Eh, lo dicevo un attimo prima. I was, as I was saying uh, just now, uh, and I've almost finished, I wonder whether it was useful to show you those uh, pictures. Uh, you can find those images online, in fact, as well. That, that, that might even be harmful. You might think that the whole of Sardinia is like that, or the whole of this, this region is like that. That's not tr true. But I think, you know, we, we, we need to find out the truth. We, we, we mustn't allow people to keep things secret. So just a, a minute and I've finished. Um, I'm going to draw some conclusions. I've got two conclusions. A glocal is a, a fashionable uh, word. It's a neologism, a neologism, bringing together global and uh, and and local, and it, it's difficult uh, not to use a glocal. I mean, if you look at what's happening in Val Souza. But anyway, in relation to query, you can argue that there is a point to having these firing ranges. Perhaps there shouldn't be secrecy, but it is necessary to have a place where you can check rocket launchers and uh, propel, uh, uh, fuels. I mean, otherwise, everything gets a shift to, to Guyana, to the, the French overseas territory. There, 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 perhaps in Guyana, it's even more difficult to check up on what's going on.
but 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 there are um, contradictions here. Obviously, you want to have modern technology, but you, but, but, you, but you also want safety. How do you overcome uh, those contradictions? I don't have any major proposals to, or major solutions, but I've got one last thing to say. What we need to do is provide information. We need to be ensure that there is basic democracy. So if you if you like you could uh, you could resolve this problem by quoting Elio Vittorini and Mr Vittorini's solution would be that this uh, customs official this uh, king of the, his of his little beach he for the first time uh, in in many centuries uh, would uh, would need to be seen as a Sardinian as being the king of of his lands. Um, and he would need to be a modern king who would uh, provide information, uh, uh, a modern king who would even pr organise protests to express his views. Now, we as uh, representatives of the media have, said, have, said, have always said we'll be there, we'll report uh, on this news. If the news gets through to us and it's, uh, tr uh, and it's authentic, we will transmit that information. And I believe that uh, there are also institutions that can help us because... Uh, we have to have to, to we have to have inst institutions there if if people mobilize if people get themselves organized and and i'd close with uh, another image which is the 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 opposite to, to the image from Quira, but but it's something still quite close to sardinia i'm talking again about uranium the first nuclear bomb was called the gadget and it, it was exploded in in another firing range in, in Los Alamos in the United States. And then there were uh, other gadgets. One dropped over Na Hiroshima, another one dropped over Nagasaki. But the Manhattan uh, Project, um, which was which 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 led to um, the experiments in Los Alamos, well that was that was then sort of reviewed and became the crossroads operation and was moved to the other side of the to to the other side of the world to the Bikini Atoll and the New Mexico desert, which is um, pretty empty, emptier than Sardinia. Well, New, New Mexico for uh, for the Americans of 1946. Well, it wasn't that empty either. Uh, thank you very much. Grazie, Marco. <coughs> thank you very much. You've referred to identity and knowledge and you've uh, used words such as information, uh, a lack of sovereignty. Uh, these are all uh, parts of the same issue, of course. You also mentioned uh, a judicial investigation. We had invited the public prosecutor Dr. Fiordaliso from the prosecutor's office in Luze, and initially mm, there was going to be participation, but then we we uh, were sent apologies. Uh, it was made clear that they regretted that the person could not attend because the investigation is ongoing. Uh, they're exploring various avenues, and if that person from the public prosecutor's office had come along to our meeting here, then maybe they would have uh, uh, said certain things or, or told us information which uh, is currently still subject to secrecy. So they sent their apologies, but they couldn't be part of our meeting today. But uh, as we're talking about knowledge, it is an honor to have uh, Professor Gatti with us. She is a professor at the University of Modena, and she is an expert on nanotechnologies and nanopathologies in particular. She's been uh, a consultant on many cases, including the Quira case. So I'm sure that she has very valuable information for us. And without further ado, I will now give the floor to Professor Gatti. Sono io che ringrazio lei per questo. Well, let me thank you, sir, for inviting me along. It gives me an opportunity to return to Brussels 
and to present in Brussels some of the results uh, of uh, the European projects that I coordinated, in particular two projects that I coordinated. These are scientific results. And if we hadn't had the European Union, then these projects would not have come about. That's fair to say. Because in Italy, this type of research is not promoted. We wouldn't have had it. So I would like to thank the European Commission and the European Parliament for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak to you about the results, but also for allowing me to conduct the research in the first place. And the, the projects were on nanopathologies. It was called Nanopathologies 2002. At the time, it meant nothing. Nobody knew what it was. Now, of course, you hear it everywhere. You can find it on Wikipedia and so on. And nanopathology at the time, in 2002, 10 years ago, meant pathologies which brought about by micro, micro and nanoparticles. So there are various disciplines uh, that are intertwined here. It's multidisciplinary. There's the medical profession, the clinical profession, but also, of course, the side of nanotechnologies. Uh, that's at the, the, the furthest reaches of, of that technology. So nanopathologies is at a crossroads of all of those disciplines. And thank you to uh, knowledge on all of those various disciplines. We managed to m produce a contribution. Um, Quira. Could you please uh, bring up the next slide? Quira is a beautiful place. I've been told that it's fairly unspoiled. It's the same as it was 50 years ago. That's what the soldiers tell us, because they're taking care of that particular site. But there's a mix of activities there. Uh, you have the latest weapons which are tested there, and at the same time you have herders herding their flocks. So th there's a slight contradiction there, of course. Next slide, please. Next slide. As you can see here, these two stars indicate that at two different sites, military activity is ongoing, and the military activity is different. And I think that both types of activity lead to different types of pollution, and this military activity has an impact on the environment, which isn't normal. It presents an anomaly. That's the word I would use. Next slide. Here you see images which uh, show you what can happen. What you see immediately is that there are explosions at very high temperatures. Every combustion, every explosion uh, creates pollution, leads to pollution. There are always residues and those residues come from the bomb and from the targets. So, there's, there's dust which is created, which before wasn't there, which didn't exist. It's something new which is created, that dust, that polluting dust. It, of course, depends on what you use, what you put in the bomb, and so on. And you also see soldiers who are wearing protective gear, but those are just put on for the press. But in 2002, next slide, next slide, please. In 2002, what we imagined were explosions which create dust, and we at the time thought that the higher the temperature of the explosion, the finer the particulates would be, the finer the dust would be. That's what was said in a report from 1978, uh, produced by researchers, American researchers, from the Eglin US military base, which only deals with explosives. And in 78, they were trying uh, depleted uranium bombs in the desert. And they went and had a look at the residues produced by the explosions of those bombs. And they, at the time, in 1978, basically said that very fine dust was produced uh, below the level of the micron, and I, I'll explain to you later what that actually means. We didn't call them nanoparticles at the time. That concept didn't exist. But anyway, very fine dust was produced, 
and that could be inhaled and then as a result create uh, health problems. Please go ahead to the next slide. What we all understand, of course, is that that dust uh, ends up in the environment. Uh, it ends up on the grass. The grass is eaten by the sheep or by other animals. But it also, the dust also is deposited on vegetables which are being grown. Please go ahead. So, uh, persons, individuals, can either uh, eat the meat from the animals, uh, could also inhale the dust, could ingest it on vegetables. But what I'm trying to say is that there is direct but also indirect exposure to these particles. If you eat meat, which is obtained from an animal which was polluted or contaminated, then there is also indirect contact. So this dust makes its way into uh, our food chain. Now, in 2002, I bought one of the first electronic uh, microscopes, environmental microscope, thanks to the European Union and the research. Now we have a field emission gun, which is even more complicated and refined. But I was looking at biological tissue, environmental tissue, and I wasn't look at, looking at it uh, uh, as a biologist, but as a, uh, an expert uh, on physics. So with this new approach, I try and investigate the exposure that that tissue uh, was subjected to. So I look at the pathological tissue of patients, and I can trace what I see there to the pollution in the field. And it allowed us in those patients to eliminate the exposure uh, they were being uh, subjected to. And we, in that way, by eliminating the exposure, also managed to help them uh, further. Next slide. Here on this scheme, you see what we're talking about. Uh, you know, it says PM10. That means particulate matter 10 microns. So these are the particulates that the various environmental agencies look for. And these particles cannot exceed a certain threshold. It's banned under European legislation because scientists in the past have already said, well, to inhale dust is dangerous. You can inhale oxygen, but dust is bad. So you have a PM10 value which is the same size of a red blood cell, more or less. But the particulates which I'm talking about are smaller than a, bac uh, a bacterium. They're molecules. They're tiny. Uh, they're the size of vitamins, proteins, DNA. And they interact directly with those uh, entities because they're so small. So it's a new risk to human health. And the toxicological analysis... Uh, which is, after all, what my research is about, uh, uh, looks at developing those tests. These new technologies give rise to uh, nanoparticulates, and we look for those. Next slide. If you have a large particulate, the one that you see on the left, uh, 30 micron, if you inhale that, it goes into your lungs. It will stay in the lung alveoli but if you look at the right then you will see that there are two white dots those white dots are within a blood vessel so they're in direct contact with red blood cells that's very very fine dust which is inhaled and when inhaled goes beyond the physical barrier that the lungs present there's a professor from Leuven, not far from here, who demonstrated that if we inhale dust of 0.1 micron, not 1 micron or 10 microns, but 0.1 microns, that that, does, that dust which is inhaled does not stay in the lungs, but actually ends up in our bloodstream. And that happens in 60 seconds from when you've inhaled the dust. 60 seconds. And once that dust is in your blood system, 
in your bloodstream, then it ends up in your kidneys and in your liver. So within a minute, that makes its way to your lungs and your liver, and from there it can go anywhere in your body. It can go anywhere into your internal organs, uh, testicles, brain, it can go anywhere. So the physiological barriers which we know no longer exist. This dust will breach those barriers. Uh, please, next slide, next slide, next slide again. The European project that I was talking about earlier allowed us to prove that this very fine dust goes beyond the lungs and can actually end up in your bloodstream. But the same applies uh, to contaminated food. If I eat a leaf of lettuce in my salad and it has dust, then I will not get rid of that dust in my feces. Even if I eat it rather than inhale it, it can still end up in my bloodstream, end up in my liver and my kidneys. And I, I, it will stay there. You won't break it down in your body. I will go and find it. So we've developed technology, thanks to the European project, that allows us to establish that. We managed to find that fine dust. And this is a very rare image of a uranium particulate in the lung of a person. And it's not a soldier. This is a person who was exposed to it in some different way. As you can see, there are peaks here in that red chart. Well, one is uranium, the other one is potassium, the other one is phosphorus. So uranium, if it is present, can be seen. We'll find it. It can be identified through the technology that we've developed. So this is a unique case. From my point of view and in my experience, this is a unique case. And what I see, next slide, uh, is also something different. This is a little ball. It looks fairly innocuous. But it's zirconium, zirconium, and I found this in a soldier's intestine. It's a gastric, it's a gastric adenocarcinoma in a soldier, and it's very strange for this to appear. First of all, because it's very small, it's round in shape, which means that it comes from an explosion. So, first of all you need an explosion of more than 2,000 degrees for this to appear. Now, where can you replicate that in a, la a laboratory? It's difficult to achieve this. If you have a depleted uranium, uranium bomb which explodes, then at the moment of explosion, you have a temperature of above 3,000 degrees. And it's only in that particular situation that this can be ingested, that this round ball is formed and that it can be inhaled or ingested by the person. So it's clear that this person was ex exposed to that. Uh, next slide. Here, do you see the white dot? To you it might seem uh, meaningless. But again, this is pollution in the blood of a patient. Sorry, this was a patient who had problems and we found this in a lymph node. This is chromium, chlorine, and phosphorus. But this composition cannot be found in any material. There is no material known to man which has that composition. And again, this was formed on the moment when the explosion took place. So you have a specific situation, an explosion, and this material was produced. And this was found in a lymph node, a non-Hodgkin's lymph node. Next slide, please. Here you find non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in a soldier and bismoda. So again, very strange things happening. Next slide. No, please go back. Yes, that slide. This is again a very strange case. These are nanoparticles, cobalt nanoparticles, again, it's not normal to find these. I find them because I work in nanotechnologies and nanopathologies. But these were found in a prostate tumour of a soldier, and that soldier for 30 years was a minesweeper, or, or he, 
he would go to certain sites, he would make mines explode and detonate them. So he, he by dint of his work, was faced with explosives on a, on a regular basis. And of course, we found plenty of heavy metals in his body. And this here is a case from Quira. Again, very strange. In a lymph node, I find the presence of lead, tit titanium, chrome, silicium. And again, how can this person have been exposed to this? If you find all of these nanoparticles, which are aggregated, you find lead. Well, in Quira, there isn't that much traffic. There's almost no traffic. There is no other industry there. So, this mix of lead, chromium and titanium must again come from an explosion, a specific explosion that contained those elements. So to find this in a lymph node, for me, it calls for an explanation. It's like finding uh, copper bowls or, or iron bowls. If you have a cancer of the uterus of a woman, uh, then you need to explain why you find certain substances there. And the explanation we have found is fairly straightforward. If the partner was contaminated, then that contamination uh, was in the sperm. That sp sperm was passed on during intercourse. And that's burning semen disease. That's what we call it. The wives of soldiers know this disease very well. And there's an article in Nature which talks about that. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. In Nature, there was uh, the title of the article which said, the soldier who brought the war home. Please go back. Yes, that slide. This is the antimonium bowl. The timony bowl that was found. I shouldn't be finding this in the uterus of a woman. That shouldn't happen. So, again, there needs to be an explanation. We looked at seminal fluid of some of the soldiers. And what do we see here? We find uh, particles, extraneous material, which has a very strange composition. Uh, this doesn't occur. Silicium, lead, sorry, chlorium, titanium, iron. This composition, in this form, can only mean one thing. Again, an explosion. And by pure coincidence, these elements combined and gave rise to this particular result. But the person was exposed to this, uh, inhaled it, was contaminated by it, uh, and made, uh, this made its way into the seminal fluid. I've made the same point uh, in other presentations. If you look at the Twin Towers and what happened there, then the explosion of the two uh, airplanes and the collapse of the towers led to certain combinations. And I'm involved in work in Washington to look at what happened there. But again, you're talking about a person from Quira that has lead, chromium, uh, and other matters in his sperm. There has to be an explanation. The only explanation can be what I've been telling you all along. Explosions. Next slide. Next slide, please. Again, a very strange image. You see a live spermatozoan. This is done through very advanced technology. If you see, if you look at this, the, the square, there's a live uh, sperm, and it's very close to the lead nanoparticle, and that's passed on to the sexual partner. A again, the sexual partner was not exposed directly, but is nonetheless uh, contaminated. What we found is that the dust, when it makes its way into the blood of a woman in particular, can also be passed on to the offspring, to the embryo. And when it's passed on to the embryo, then it can do a lot of damage. Next slide. This is a, an image from 2004. 
So you saw it before in the video as well, but it went round the world. It's an image, it's a picture I took in 2004. This lamb doesn't have eyes or a brain, and instead of the eyes has ears. Here, next image, this is a lamb. Where, when the fetus was growing, there was a problem which led to malformation and of course this lamb died as soon as it was born next slide but in the brain no sorry in the liver and in the testicles for example we found dust uh, cobalt uh, and so on again this is not normal this is very specific pollution the mother was polluted passed it on to the lamb the mother got rid of the pollution, but uh, the lamb absorbed it uh, and died as a result. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. These, these are the latest images from this year. I skipped through some of them because we're not used to seeing these images. I've seen them and I've seen them in humans as well, and that's the problem. What happens to sheep it can also happen to humans and has happened to humans. And it should not be permitted to find these things in an animal which has never been exposed to urban pollution and to find a brain containing nanoparticles of silicon, iron, aluminium, titanium and potassium. And yet it happens. That's what I come across in my work. The white dots on the image are extraneous, uh, is extraneous matter. This again is a, an antimony particle in the brain. That's something which is used in explosives. An antimony particle in the brain. Next slide. Here you find some images of dust that was found in certain specific areas in the area. You have these, this dust in the environment, you can't hide that, that remains there, and then you find it in persons. So there is that link, there is that explanation. But you, sir, made reference to Vega and Ariane and certain programs that are carried out on the site, and the site is not a bad thing in itself. Uh, now, for example, you find the presence of aluminium, but new technologies lead to new pollution, uh, and that can be traced. Just one last slide that I'll show you. This is a result of another European project that I coordinated on nanotoxicologies. And these are two DNA parts of a cell which are separating. A cell is separating in two parts, and uh, the genetic heritage is being divided equally over the two parts. And you see those two grey parts. Well, one part is normal, and that will form a new cell. The other is rounded off and rolled up, and the reason is because there was a, 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 a nano entity close to it. So it's wrapping around this extraneous matter. And this is not toxic. But it has a, a very different toxicity. We're spending a great deal of money to assess the nanotoxicology of nanoproducts. And you find that there are unwanted formations of nanoparticles as a result of explosions. Now this can get in direct contact with DNA and that means that the DNA is damaged and that can then lead to cancer or a whole raft of other problems. So there is clear scientific evidence that shows that specific pollution of a certain type can lead to problems in the environment and can lead to health problems. Next slide. This is a book that presents uh, the results of the European project. It's called Nanopathology. Next slide. I'd like to thank you for your attention and for listening.
But uh, with your uh, permission, sir, could I be given some time at the end of the second part to look at the future of Quira, the Quira site? I've been pointing uh, to fairly negative things, which are fairly self-evident, but that doesn't mean that we can't work towards a healthier future by putting in place certain precautions. So I have a few more slides that I could possibly show you later on. Uh, where I proffer a number of solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I think from the scientific point of view, your point of view was very useful for us. I'd like to recall uh, some of the things you said we're not talking about an entire environment. We're not talking about the whole of Sardinia. We're not talking about the whole of the firing range. And of these uh, cases uh, that you have studied scientifically, we're not uh, uh, talking only about uh, cases relating to this particular firing range. You talked about some other cases as well. And uh, as I have received uh, some information about this, from, from other quarters. In fact, they t the mayor of uh, Pedas de Forgo uh, sent me a, a note and says that uh, there have been some other, there have been other investigations. An, an investigation was carried out by the uh, by the Sardinian Animal Breeding Institute. They have looked into the herds. They have examined the fodder. They've tested the the dairy products produced by the animals, and and they've learnt uh, two things. I'm just just to get just to add to the information that you have provided. And this is something we can take up later in the debate, but this this note from the mayor makes it clear that the the, the contamination pollution is quite limited there are some uh, uh, some clean results and so it's not throughout the island that there's been a negative impact on the food ch chain i don't want that people to get the wrong impression and I don't, I don't, don't want uh, people to think that uh, the local administration and the local politicians are not trying to, uh, to, to deal with the problems. We're not, uh, we're not just a, a fact-finding committee. If we wanted just the truth, we would go to the courts. Uh, we would go to um, various institutions in order to, to find out the truth. But he, we're here today in order to hold a debate. Uh, as as non-experts, really, we're we're not, we're not prejudiced. We're not we're not to, for for this information or against it. We're we're trying to be impartial. We're trying to to do some awareness raising in Europe, and we thank everyone for, for who's helping us to do that. I'd also like to thank all those who've organised this meeting. I'd like to thank. Uh, the Christian move. Uh, to thank the Christian movement uh, against against uh, the Christian movement against war. The Christian movement for peace. The speaker made a mistake and said the Christian movement for war. I'm sure you'll understand. It was a Freudian slip. I'd like to thank the Christian movement for peace uh, for helping to organise this uh, initiative. They helped us to organise this event. Uh, we thought it would be impossible to organise this conference, but in fact we've managed to do it. So it's thanks to, to, to you as well, in part. So thanks for coming along and thanks for helping. Let's now move on uh, away from science for a moment to, to politics. And let's move to, to the national political scene. Now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Augusto Di Stanislao. He uh, sits on the defence committee of the uh, Italian lower house. He's been dealing with this uh, subject. He, he's provided a document, which is in your file. Now we, we, we've, we've also got a, a document from Mrs. Gatti as well, Professor Gatti, 
So now we're going to move, as I said, from from uh, from a scientist to a politician, and then we'll hear more about uh, about the, what's happening in the area. We'll hear from some local representatives as well, and then of course we'll open the floor for debate. So, um, Augusto, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ujas. Thank you very much, Mr. Kachin. I'm. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to be a plain speaker with no flourishes. This is an important moment in time. This does give us the opportunity to create a, a network of uh, a network of, of people who have information. And I hope that um, that, 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 that this exchange of information will lead to action. And I hope that, that we'll move on from the analysis to to to, to deeds, to facts. I mean, I mean, we, we, I mean we, we need to sort of forget the people who are responsible for this to take action. I think today's meeting is an important part of uh, the whole procedure. It's an important step. We've brought together uh, members of the European Parliament, brought together members of the Italian Parliament. So that means that we're looking at this from an institutional point of view, from a political point of view, we're looking at this from a scientific point of view, we're trying to work out who is responsible. Uh, you were talking about reality and responsibility, but we want to ensure that people living in this area can live with uh, with dignity. Now, I'm I am the head of the, the, the my political group on the Defence Committee, and I want to, to, to look at what other people have done here, assess what other people have done. I, as a Member of Parliament, uh, obviously to produce reports and all I can do is really uh, bring together facts um, try to analyze those facts in a critical way and also I, have, I can look I have to look at the needs of the constituency I never act as an individual only I always try to link what I do to what people back home need I try to work out how I can serve my constituency and uh, in order to clear the ground of any of any confusion, I'm always on the side of the citizen, full stop. And, and, and I, I also respect the European uh, precautionary principle. Other people uh, need to give us answers. Gemma, Maria, I'm not looking for the truth necessarily, but I'm trying to get people to shoulder their responsibility. I mean, and I'm trying to get other people to give answers as well. They need to give us those answers. But anyway, the 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 efforts that we're making are designed to ensure that we do shed light on the truth, but also we need to uh, get get into our political institutions to be courageous, so that they can bring about change. That's the the next piece in the puzzle, really. The next piece of the puzzle is getting people to change. I'm not just going to tell you about a reality. I want to take acts in order to change realities, obviously with help of those people who are in positions of responsibility. But uh, I want to, to act as a politician. I, I want to help shed light. I want to ensure that people can live under dignified conditions. And we also we, I want to act as a, as a personal, as a conscience, and the conscience of the people that, that I represent. So I'm saying that if there are certain, uh, if there's been, the, if certain things have been done, if there's certain th things have, 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 have happened, then I need to find out what's happened, who's done it. And when we're talking about t constituencies, if we're talking about Sardinia, and in fact, uh, 60% of, of uh, Sardinia is, is used for this sort of uh, exercise, this sort of military exercise, and, and this, these military exercises have an impact on public health, and so something has to be done. But I'm just going to produce the sort of material that you've seen, the sort of material you've got in your file, and these are facts that we can't deny. Uh, and In fact, the public authorities haven't answered any of our questions. The military haven't answered uh, our questions. So I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but, but I have put down a resolution on the committee and the the government, the Ministry of Defence, have told me that they don't have the necessary information to be able to answer such a, a difficult 
question. And so the, the government and the Ministry of Defence want time to answer. But but obviously, I I respect everything that's been said today by Jan Maria as well. And so I asked with a great deal of respect uh, exactly what the public authorities want to do in order to try to start answering questions and shouldering responsibilities, given that other people have done their bit. Uh, but now, uh, within the government, within the Ministry of Defence, um, uh, the efforts have been made to eschew responsibility, and that we can't allow that to happen. So when it comes to the whole question of depleted uranium, we've got to get the government to give us certain answers. We can we can't just we can't just allow the government to have more time to collect information they've already got all the information they need they've got the documentation they need there's the signum project this is a, a, a genotoxic study that was carried out and according to the general doctor on veto, this should have allowed the government to to work out uh, to what it, to, with the dangers of exposure to depleted uranium. That study was carried out in 2004, and the government at the time and the ministry at the time spent uh, 1.6 million on a study. But we don't know anything about the results of the study. But although the study was seen as revolutionary and as a definitive answer, but. Uh, that, that, that study has been archived. But there's, but is there. But that doctor, that military doctor, did appear before the Defence Committee back in 2004. I just wanted to draw attention to certain things. I think people have to, as I said, the government and the Ministry of Defence have to shoulder responsibility, have to take take action. Now, there has to be a commitment from the government, because in the resolution before the committee, we've asked that the government commit itself to check uh, to what extent this committee that was supposed to look into this can what it now says about the risks related to the uh, environmental contamination it, it, we, the, we, you can't just say that there be the, the they can't just say that there are there are accidents because there seems to be documentary evidence that there have been illnesses linked to a military service now i'm afraid this is impossible to do because the speaker is just reading a document we need to know why the secret services, since the Somalia intervention, have not let us know let us know what risks our soldiers were exposed to there during that operation in Somalia. And we've had military personnel working in dangerous areas since um, some, the operation in Somalia. The people, have, people have our military personnel have been exposed to danger in these uh, firing uh, ranges. And the Signum study uh, was said was said was said at the time to be very important. And we were supposed to be able to refer to that, but we haven't received it. But we need to know why proper protection measures haven't been taken in these firing ranges. We don't know what precautions have been taken to protect civilians and military personnel working there. We need to be able to monitor what the the, the committee of inquiry, the Preville committee, has done, and uh, with also there been a committee of inquiry in the Senate, and we need to know um, what uh, what has been done by the, those committees about the many complaints from members of the military and their families. And finally, we need to start as soon as possible. Uh, research and, and inquiries, we need to launch inquiries to look into the state of con uh, contamination of the Quira uh, firing range and we need to, to be able to assess the damage done to the environment, uh, the local population, the civilian workers in the firing range and the military personnel. We also need to know to what extent water in Quira has been contaminated. I'm drawing your attention to these things because these are part of a series of initiatives that have have uh, brought me into close uh, contact to this area. Uh, I've gotten, I've been in touch with citizens. I've been in touch with people working in the military in in Quira, and I'm sure that we will be able to work better were we to use information coming from the defence ministry. It's only the people in the defence ministry that have the information that we know that that, that information could allay f fears. So we, so I don't just want to complain. I don't just want to compile these large files. 
I have been concerned to bring together a certain amount of information and I've called my file uh, the uh, state of indifference, the indifference of the state. That's my title, because basically we're still in the dark. I represent uh, the opposition in Parliament, but somebody has to provide answers. We need answers from the government. We need answers from the Ministry of Defence. We can't just be told yet again that uh, that uh, the public authorities need time uh, to to collect information to 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 put together a file. I mean, the, I think we've 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 learnt a lot today in this important debate, and this is information which is owned by this territory, owned by this part of Sardinia. We, action needs to be taken and we can't delay it anymore. What's been done today is very important because we've raised this matter and brought it before the European Parliament. We've also raised these matters in the Italian Parliament. And in fact, with Mr. Ugis, we'll be, uh, we'll be lodging a resolution in the Italian Parliament as well. We'll be raising a, a question there because we need to go back to where the problem first emerged and we need to insist on getting answers. I'm convinced that to today the the new government and the defence ministry must be forced to give information. Perhaps they will be able to, to give us a bit more information now, but I hope that what we've created so far, they created this network of people who are interested in this matter, and I hope this will uh, help with the awareness raising, but I also ho ho hope this will help us to achieve critical mass so that public authorities will start to move and that will finally uh, public authorities will provide the truth, because the truth belongs um, not to the state, but to the people. And I hope that the, 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 the added value would be that finally we'd get some policy changes, so we could not just get the proper living conditions for people in this area, but also um, tranquility. People, once people know, once people know that, the, the, once people living in this area know the full truth, the truth they'll be able to, to have all their fears allayed. Now, this is a, a very important battle and uh, politicians can't do everything on their own. We need the citizens to stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with us and, and together we can achieve something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. De Stanislaw. Well, we appreciate your approach. We're glad that you've been in touch with locals in this area. Um, we're glad that you're proposing uh, policy changes. That, that, that's your job as a politician. And now let's uh, hear from uh, Peppino Fanni. And after that, we'll hear from the Vice President of the province of Oljastra, which is where the Quira base is to be found. And I will also hear from the Environmental Councillor of, of La Madalena Town Hall, that's Mrs uh, Maria Piedzonka. And while we're hearing from those speakers, I'll ask uh, you to, to put your names down to speak in the debate. So while we're hearing from those different speakers, if you... Please let us know if you want to have the floor to ask questions or make uh, comments. But in the meanwhile, I'll give the floor to Mr Pepino Fanny, who is the Provincial Secretary of the CISL uh, Trade Union from Oliastro. Thanks very much for coming along. Good afternoon. And thank you very much, uh, Gian Mario, for this uh, uh, very laudable initiative I represent not only workers but also citizens uh, as a trade union uh, representative. So my uh, presentation will take that particular slant. Now, I, I'm sorry, I never read something out, but today I'll make an exception because this is a very delicate issue. And uh, you will have understood from what the previous speaker said that it is indeed very sensitive. And as a secretary general, I need to weigh my words carefully. I've worked on this text, reworked it, looked at it again, and I hope it won't be any longer than seven or eight minutes. 
could interpreters please point out that reading out really shouldn't be done? I'll read it out. This is the Chisel assessment on the experimented military base in Quira. There is a debate which is raging in the media, and it's driven by the media, on the presence of the firing range. And that means that any arguments in, uh, adduced by the persons involved are always uh, partisan. There's a, a diatribe, and people are either clearly in favour of the military ground or against the military ground. Each of the parties, each of the camps, always adduces the most varied arguments. Uh, and this is happening in all of the, the regions uh, in Sardinia. I'm speaking on behalf of the Chisel in Sardinia. But the activities which are ongoing uh, afflict a great number of persons uh, within the base and outside the base and also has an impact on the social and economic life in Sardinia. As a trade union, over the years, we've tried to address this issue from a slightly different angle. And we look at the work which is carried out in these areas, we look at the social impact uh, of the, these activities, and we look at what this brings about in our various communities. Uh, and we look at how all of that can be reconciled. There are environmental issues which are brought about uh, by these activities, and of course we need to look into those as well. For time now, we've stated that this is a very important issue. Uh, we shouldn't just look at the areas which are involved, but we should also involve the region, the Finn Mechanica, and the national government, so that specialists can look at this, and so that this ground can be developed further, create jobs, and so that there is a benefit for the entire region. We don't take a conservative museum approach to the environment in our area. We're in favour of a dynamic approach which promotes human activity, but of course we need to make sure that the necessary checks and balances are in place. Uh, that's the assessment we have of the presence of the military firing, firing ground in Quira. The Perdas de Fogo firing uh, ground it is important to the entire region of Sardinia because of the activity that is carried out uh, there uh, and also because of the, uh, the initiatives it creates. Over the years, many experiments have taken place in these grounds and many military staff have been trained there. And that means that the Quera ground uh, is uh, of national and international repute. The community of Perdas de Fogo and the wider region has benefited from that and that has allowed the entire area also to maintain the environment and the landscape. Could interpreters please turn out that this person is reading this at breakneck speed? The economy in the region has also benefited as a result of the military presence and that has been beefed up. So the firing range uh, is important and employs about a thousand people. 600 soldiers and 400 minister staff and this is across public and private uh, uh, companies. There are maintenance companies, people doing catering and so on. And of course there's also animal husbandry because within the military zone there is also animal husbandry. There's a clear social and economic value which the uh, firing uh, range represents. Uh, if you put a figure on that, it would be around 70 million euro. That 70 million euro is available to the entire region. Well, the interpreters are going mad, actually. You should really slow down. Well, this allows us to develop a microeconomy, and we really can't uh, go without now. It's for these reasons that the our trade union feels it is important that the firing ground uh, continues to exist in Oliastrino.
Of course, we would like to make it clear what the position of our trade union is uh, as to the future role that uh, the firing ground can play. Uh, firstly, we will make it clear that it's important for the investigation which was started by the Lanuse judiciary to be completed and to look into any damage that might have occurred, to do this uh, swiftly and uh, in a timely fashion. And this to make sure that the health uh, of our citizens can be ensured, but also to make sure that the workers in the firing ground uh, can be safe as well. The trade union and the local communities want full clarity on these matters and would like to know what kind of materials are being used and what impact this has had on the health of our citizens and the workers at the site. What kind of impact this has had on the environment and on the agro uh, herding activities. Once the presence of damaging materials has been ascertained, the Ministry of Defence, of course, will have to make sure that the necessary plans are in place uh, to clean all of this up. And the technical uh, and technological modalities will have to be clarified to make sure that any environmental pollution can be managed. We'll have to have a catalogue of the materials which are being used and which need to be monitored. And we need to come up with the right ways of disposing of those and also identify areas where we can dispose of those materials. And we want the environment to recover uh, for the landscape to be returned to normal. We want to get rid of harmful, uh, harmful materials, but we also want activity in the site to continue. So for the future, we need to make sure that we have greater transparency as to what is happening on the site, and we need to make sure that we continue to provide information to the Sardinian community about what is happening there. We should train teams of experts who can produce the necessary expertise in situ and can monitor uh, the technology needed to recover the materials and dispose of those materials. Mechanica produces the weapons which are being uh, tried out on the site and we should uh, look into setting up a site, a company which can monitor and manage the recycling of harmful materials. We should also look into the possibility of limiting the impact these materials have on health and on the environment. The information which you find in the newspapers and in the media uh, takes on apocalyptic forms and we find that not all of what is said in the media is backed up by clear scientific data. No epidemiological investigation was carried out, no in-depth health analysis was carried out on the most uh, prevailing pathologies. The only information we have goes back to uh, research which was carried out by the Sardinia region in 2006 and that was presented by the magistrate Felipe Cassoni. Uh, the research states that the health situation in the site is in keeping with the regional average. But we should carry out a mapping exercise and monitor the entire area and uh, make sure that everything is backed up by rigorous scientific uh, information. And that can then be used to protect uh, our, our animals, the workers and the population at large. Our trade union would like to call for an in-depth analysis of what happens within the site in health terms and would like for that to be monitored over the past 50 years. We'd like to look at the health of the workers on the site and uh, make sure that they continue to work in a safe environment. It's only by doing that that we know what is going on. An investigation would clear up 
any of the doubts, but would also allow us to uh, continue work at the site and to make sure that the health situation is, is in keeping with standards. That's why we've asked the Ministry of Health and the region to uh, find a way of governing this site in a harmonious way. But any study needs to look at health issues, the impact on our communities, uh, and also, of course, look at any pathologies that might arise. Well, thank you, Pepino, for reading that out. Uppermost in your mind, of course, is the position of the citizen. You represent uh, trade unions, workers and citizens alike. And you don't want an analysis which is uh, handed down uh, from a, a central level, but you would like for the regions, uh, the regional authorities to be more involved, and you want politics to, politics to be involved, but also to have a sound scientific basis. Oui, je dis qu'après, il y aura le temps pour les questions. Vous voulez parler Vous voulez... Do you want to speak now? Would you like to intervene now or later? Yes, please go ahead. There's no microphone for the speakers. You will get the chance to take the floor. But now let's close now with the last two speakers. We'll hear from the Vice President of the Oliastra province, uh, Roberto Cabidu. Uh, thank him for coming along and ask him to uh, to make his presentation. Thank you very much, John Maria. Thanks for organising this initiative. The issue of uh, Quira and its uh, firing range. I've, I've already gone beyond the island of uh, Sardinia. The, the shock waves have gone have gone further than Sardinia. There's been there's been simulated war on on Quira, but also we see a war of different ideologies taking place there. Leaving aside the fact that there is a leaving aside whether there is a real health problem there, the territory has been destroyed. And Oliastra and uh, Sarabus have uh, become the the really the, the really a tr true innocent victims, the only innocent victims of this. As I say, that the territory has been destroyed. What I mean by this, well, there has been news in the media about what's happened there, but I'd just like to remind you that uh, one Sardinian newspaper filled an entire page with the news that someone from Milan uh, swam in the sea off the Cape of San Lorenzo and his teeth turned blue. So, 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 in fact, the, 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 fact that the, the journalists have become almost too interested. We've heard all sorts of things in the media. Uh, the, we've heard a lot, a lot about a lot of suspicious deaths. But if you look at the register of uh, tumours, you'll see that the data there are in line with regional averages. And there's been mention in the media of the fact that the entire uh, territory of the firing range, that is the, the 13,000 hectares are contaminated but in fact it's only a few hectares that are contaminated and it's very it's that's very restricted area so perhaps we need to start reclaiming this land but as i said there's 13000 hectares making up this uh, firing range uh, exercise ground but only a few hectares are contaminated i'm using published data as well i sit on the technical territorial committee so i have taken part and i have followed very carefully uh, the whole issue the whole business so I just wanted to point this out, uh, and now I'll get back to my main presentation, and I want to, to make some positive proposals, some constructive proposals. Well, the value of human health is very high, and, and the and, and obviously the economy is important here, and the environment is very important here. We want to we cannot renounce human health and the, and the value of our environment. In two thousand and eight. 
an important study was carried out, environmental monitoring study, and this was this was requested by the Olyasa province and was financed by the state and it was also uh, supported by the Ministry of Defe Defence. And the idea was to check... Um, and monitor the, the results of activities. And in April 2008, a technical territorial committee was created and a, a, a group of reliable experts, ARPAS, local experts, acted as guarantors on behalf of Sarabus and Olyastra province. I followed this affair very closely, as I was saying, because uh, I... Uh, I, I, I work in the as an environmental councillor and so I sat on this technical territorial committee and uh, we got the final report uh, 20 days ago and in this final report uh, you see ev a confirmation of what I was saying earlier. So the proposal that I am making is based on the principle that all military activity which is combat compatible with the with public health and the, with the health of uh, work workers at the base and w compatible with protection of the environment and the territory should, should be not just uh, desirable, not just uh, permitted but also be seen as desirable because this military base is important for our territory, economically speaking, and so the, this military base shouldn't be called into question either by local authorities or by the state. This military base is uh, an important source of income for hundreds of local workers, and it's an important uh, uh, part of our local uh, productive fa fabric. So it's also desirable, in fact, that we even strengthen and further develop this military base and, uh, and in fact, very highly developed technology is used on the base and it is environmentally sustainable. The, the, the experimental firing range is used to test... Uh, um, test new, uh, new, new equipment and it's used to test uh, new rockets, new uh, airplanes. It was set up in 1956. It's the only firing ground of this type in Italy. What we can say is that within the Quira firing range, there there are uh, exercises, training exercises uh, uh, from Italy and from abroad. We have the air, we have the, the Rome Aerospace Department and the European Aerospace uh, Department send uh, uh, experts to Quira. Quira has had an important role in uh, aerospace aerospatial research of Italy, and in Quira you, you see there's important companies which are providing command and control equipment, which is then bought in national and uh, internationally. Vita Sizzle is one of these companies. It's part of an international network which is of recognised uh, excellence, technical and scientific excellence. Peter Cizet is one of the biggest Italian private companies uh, when it has to its uh, turnover and know-how, and it works in the area of electronics and integrated logistics. It's an important national and European resource, and it carries out and manages in electronic and in informatic systems that can be used in the civilian sphere and the military sphere, and it carries out orders on behalf of private companies, on behalf of public companies. It's a leader in the area of research and development. And we have the Esetre Log Consortium there as well. It, car it carries out uh, systems and creates syst systems. And we also have Selex, the integrated system. These groups have the aim of uh, making this uh, this this uh, base into a centre of excellence for the provision and creation of logistics, which can be used in the area of defence, allowing us to create equipment which will allow Italy to compete with leaders in this area. So, so, so that the, these companies, which are situated on the in the firing range, make a huge uh, contribution to the economy of the area. There's also a study which identifies the technical and procedural and operational aspects for the, the exchange of data between civil workers and the military so that we can ensure that there is a proper cooperation in post-crisis management. And then there's also research being done here into humanitarian assistance. 
the strategy could be to promote in, in, at the firing range various research and development activities and various training act activities in the area of dual-use technologies, i.e. technologies that can be used in the civilian and the military sphere. And so this is, will be a centre of excellence which can work with uh, national and international universities. It also makes the area an, an area of interest from the tourist, touristic point of view as well. So this firing range is a very is very important. It we 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 can use the this fire, this uh, firing range as a, a cluster as a center of excellence for research and development. So the proposal we would like to make is to create uh, alongside the firing range a a, 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 a an industrial site for promoting dual use technologies and the idea would be to promote integrated res research and development activities involving research institutes universities and private companies and in that way we'll be promoting the competitiveness of the territory our, our area is made our territory is made available for exercises and for for training and we, 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 we're we ready now to start reclaiming the, the areas that have been uh, been contaminated. We have this, we have this interna we have an international project which will uh, create uh, high value jobs. I'm afraid that again we have a speaker who's just reading a text at 100 miles an hour, which we don't have. So we're creating this technological centre of excellence, which uh, needs to be opened up to other research areas. We want to, we want in cooperation with national research institutes and international research institutes, and we want also to create a, a training school in this area. So this technological district, which would would allow this uh, interforce firing range in Quira to become a very important uh, part of the socio-economic fabric of uh, Sardinia. Research activities will take place there, research, research which will be uh, of use for the civilian sector and for the military sector. And we, we hope that it will be a safe uh, uh, firing ground, uh, respecting the environment, respecting public health, We will be working with the most the, the, the most local university, which is the University of Nuoro, and we will also be working with the uh, University of Cagliari. We hope that the, this the, creating this centre of excellence, this cluster, will allow us to uh, also create a lot of jobs. This is an experimental uh, firing ground, which allows us to demonstrate and test civilian technology and military uh, technology. We work also with the firing ground in uh, Sarabus and, uh, and we hope that both these, these two firing grounds will carry on being able to make a major contribution to the local economy. Well, Roberto has given the opinion uh, of those who, uh, who live in the area. And it's a bit simplistic if you say that uh, we take note of the fact that uh, there's a negative situation. Th this, this is a, a complex issue with various different facets. So I do think that your intervention was important uh, for the purpose of our discussion. We'll have our last intervention now and then will open up the floor. I'll give the floor to Bastiano Composto, who is the representative of Sardinia Naziona, and to Federico Palomba. And then uh, afterwards, I'll give the floor to anyone who's uh, made it clear that they want to speak. But we'll hear now from Maria Pia Zanca, who in uh, the municipality of La Maddalena is a councillor. This is uh, a municipality which had uh, a NATO military base on its territory, the military bases has now gone and they're trying to look for other activities in their area to replace uh, the activity that was lost. So they, in a way, form a bridge between the military past uh, and the new future. So, Maria Pia, you have the floor. Dulcis in fundum, 
uh, a woman as the last uh, speaker. Grazie, grazie. Troppo buoni. Thank you. You're too kind. Well, let me thank the ALDE group in Parliament uh, for organising this. My own party in Italy is from the same family, and I would like to thank Mr Kachin, who I've met today, and others for organising this very interesting uh, seminar. I'm uh, Councillor for the Environment in the municipality of La Maddalena, and uh, Maddalena is not an area where exercises are carried out or experiments, uh, unlike uh, uh, what is the case in La Quira on the firing range. Our problem is that uh, the military forces are leaving our island, and that uh, brings about uh, especially economic problems. Maddalena has a very strategic position. To the north we have the Bocca di Bonifacia, uh, which I I is the bit of sea that separates Sardinia from Corsica, which is part of France. So because of its strategic position, since 1767, uh, La Maddalena has been an Italian Navy base. And in 1970, in a very ambiguous way, on the part of the Ita Italian government, uh, on the island of Santo Stefano, which is part of La Maddalena Ar uh, Archipelago, a, a mooring station was uh, granted to uh, the uh, Americans for a supply ship to their nuclear submar submarine. Now, 35 years later, the US Navy has decided to leave the archipelago of La Maddalena. Now, there's, there's been a slow decline of the Italian Navy presence in La Maddalena and, and on top of that the US Navy is now uh, leaving and that's going to present serious uh, social and economic challenges to us. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister at the time, Romano Prodi, when uh, it was announced that the US Navy was leaving, uh, felt that in 2009 the G8 should have its summit meeting at La Maddalena. Now, in a way, they wanted to compensate the archipelago uh, for the fact that the US Navy was now leading, uh, leaving and that we'd been uh, great in our support to them. But the reason to have the G8 summit there was also to give international visibility to the archipelago, archipelago and, and to give uh, renewed impetus to the archipelago, uh, not to just have this, this, this stable economy based on military presence, but uh, to also uh, start sustainable tourism. So basically, 330 million euro uh, was invested to reclaim the archipelago of La Maddalena, and two main works were to be carried out. Uh, one was to uh, provide accommodation to the heads of state and government for the G8 summit, and uh, the second work was on where the summit was actually to take place. So, La Maddalena is preparing for this major event, uh, has a lot of visibility, and this was to launch its economy after the Navy leaves. But unfortunately, the Prodi government falls. There are elections in Italy, and Berlusconi is voted into office. Now, Berlusconi, from the get-go, in a very subtle way sometimes, and sometimes in a fairly blunt way, has started making it clear that he's not in favour of the G8 being... Uh, organized in La Maddalena. Then, in April of 2009, there is the earthquake in L'Aquila, and to show support to the people in L'Aquila, it was then decided that the G8 meeting should take place there, because visibility in the media and from the entire world was needed in that particular area of Italy at the time. So, in La Maddalena, 330 million euro were spent, public money, 
to create jobs, but no jobs were created. Zero jobs. And we're still there, waiting. So, our dream, which is that we were going to be a sustainable tourism island, has gone. And the old Navy base was to become the hub uh, of activity and was to be the, at the heart of our economic reconversion uh, and yet nothing has happened. There have been a few summits uh, at the sites that were developed but apart from that nothing. So for the past three years uh, we are in dire straits. We are having serious social and economic problems for the past three years because these structures which w were built and reclaimed for a, a relaunch are not being used. So 330 million euro was spent but it's almost never used the infrastructure and unfortunately we also want to reclaim matters at sea. Uh, where the Navy bases where the G8 was to take place, the seas there are to some extent polluted and work was to be carried out there. The judiciary has carried out investigations and there are heavy metals, mercury, hydrocarbons which have been found in the sea, so the sea is polluted. And there is clear environmental pollution and there's another investigation which has been opened into that. Uh, a number of companies are involved, uh, subcontractors and so on. But in the media you have a lot of speculation on the part of journalists and we are mentioned a lot as well. I mean the latest uh, mention was in La Repubblica. And they claim that not the entire archipelago of La Maddalena is affected by the pollution but only the area which I'm talking about. Uh, uh, and that has to be borne in mind. Now, what I'm trying to say is that the inhabitants of La Maddalena are having difficulty and th th there's the, Russia, the tale of the Russian farmer who fell asleep uh, open-mouthed, uh, a snake went into the mouth uh, and took over, basically, and th that's what seems to have happened to us. I mean, initially the farmer was happy but then to the farmer it became clear that the reptile was governing his will and life and that's what's happened to us and it's only by getting rid of the reptile the snake that the farmer can can, can go back to the previous life of self-determination for us the snake was the US Navy and the Italian Navy who had their military base. They gave us uh, a false sense of security. We didn't develop any alternatives as a result of their presence. There was this monoculture and uh, now we're left to pick up the pieces. Now as I said over years the Italian Navy has been scaling down its activity. Now the US Navy is also left and we're having serious problems. There's a 2009 regional law which identifies La Maddalena officially as an area in crisis. We're a disadvantaged region and this should now allow us to have uh, access to certain funds to, to develop local issues. So we're trying to set up projects which allow us to explore new economic activities and we hope with those projects to overcome the economic difficulties uh, we have. It's up to us now, the inhabitants of La Maddalena, to do something about this uh, together with our, our regional politicians and we need to make sure that we uh, take a, a hold of our future. Now it's going to be a difficult birth, birth is always difficult because you always cry when you're born, but at least we will be in charge of our own destiny. Thank you very much. Uh, you made some uh, 
useful proposals there. So let's now move on to the debate. Uh, we're going to open the floor for debate. I have a, a list of uh, 13 speakers. Now, so that everyone can uh, speak, I myself uh, won't uh, make a speech. I'll just wind up briefly at the end. So now I haven't uh, taken the floor, so I'd ask you not to speak for, for too long either. So now I'll give you the floor and I'll call your names out. Turn the microphone on. Uh, the button is to the right of the microphone. Uh, introduce yourselves and then I'll make a sign uh, once you've uh, spoken for a, for, a, for a certain amount of time. So I'll give the floor now to... Bastiano Compostoli, leader of uh, the Sardinian nation. And then we'll he hear from Federico Palomba, and then the third speaker will be the person who I've already informed. I'll let you know uh, as your t turn comes. Io, oh, fare refer I want to refer to the main topic today's debate, military pollution in non-war zones. I'm referring to the title of the conference because Sardinia, I believe, I'm in favour of Sardinian independence. I think the presence of the Italian state is... Uh, is just uh, uh, just replacing the other conquerors that have been on our island. Uh, it's been one invasion after another. I, I don't think we'll always be Italian. Another invader will turn up, I'm sure. But anyway, I want to say something about the role of Europe. There is something new today in the world. Uh, we've, not, we've got Europe, we've got uh, the European Union, we've got the European Parliament. We don't have a European government exactly, but uh, we do have this political uh, entity which, which which didn't exist in the past and which exists now. And this, the European Union has duties. It has duties towards the people of Sardinia. Even this small people living on this small island in the middle of uh, uh, the Mediterranean uh, has the right to be recognised as a European people. And Europe, I think, has to shoulder its responsibilities. The European Parliament uh, really needs to make its uh, its role felt, make its its presence felt. In Sardinia, we are basically slaves to the Italian state. We have been subjugated by the Italian state. In fact, uh, the Italian uh, the, the Italian state has. Has, has taken over 80% of, of, of our territory and it, the military actually uses 80% of our island. And if you look at the relationships between the relationship between France and Mururoa, well, for France, what, what is Mururoa? Well, it, it's, just a, it's just a launch pad. It's just a firing range. It was, was, uh, it, they wouldn't carry out nuclear tests uh, uh, in France because that would hurt the, the, the French. Instead, they'd carry out nuclear testing in Mururoa, uh, as if the people of Mururoa were, uh, were not, were not uh, vulnerable. So Sardinia, for the Italian state, is just a small, uh, so just a bigger version of a Mururoa. It uh, has the same role as Mururoa does for the French state. And who can un who understands this? Well, well, I think who can understand this? Well, I think the European Union can understand this, and the European Parliament can understand this. In fact, there is a motion for a resolution. Uh, there's a joint motion for resolution, which uses the term uh, deplores. And it, it, it deplores uh, and condemns this resolution. Con condemns those who who have uh, used uh, uh, cluster bombs and have not then uh, c cleaned up these uh, these areas once the war is over, or once the trust is over. And I think Sardinia uh, could be assimilated to a war zone. So you, you, you talked about the devastating effect of cluster bombs in war zones. You should be talking about what's happening in Sardinia because we, we've had tests of the cluster, cluster bombs. We've got, we've got evidence that cluster bombs have been exploded. 
and I would like to quote, quote the, 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 uh, the ruling of the Lusay Court, and uh, this doesn't come from nowhere. There is a ruling from a, a court, a Lusay Court, and, uh, and a court doesn't just come up with a ruling just like that. And the information contained in this ruling is very worrying because the, the, cause it talks about the accumulation of uh, uh, special waste in this territory, toxic, toxic waste, toxic substances. And the court ruling also talks about this is linked to uh, um, this, this is linked linked to the creation of a an, an environmental disaster on the island. And then the ruling continues and talks about um, the, the about the, the the spreading of the damage. And the fact that, and in fact, that public health is now in in danger. And in fact, and, and and so in, in, this is a, a ruling which we can't ignore. We can't be indifferent to this ruling. And then, of course, I'm aware that the local administrators, the regional administrators, have to uh, look at this issue. They have to come up with proposals so that we can overcome these difficulties. But one of the facts is, well, if you if you uh, look at what the, uh, the the administrator of the uh, of the province has said, if you look at the register, he says he's looked at the register of tumours. But but if you look at the register of tum register of tumours, you see that people who have died with a, a cancerous tumour come from the area very close to Quira, or else they or they're they're, they're, they're work people who've been working for this Vitro Chizet company. If you so so. So somebody perhaps climbed a mountain and uh, used a spray, and, uh, and perhaps it was a windy day, and we don't know where the the where the nanoparticles went to. And Mrs. Gatti was talking about nanoparticles. They could be on a child's hair. They could be on a cheese that we're eating. Uh, they could be on a herd that's grazing. So the, we're not trying to um, to to create panic. We're not trying to create. Uh, alarm but you've got to read this ruling you've got to see what the reality is uh, and any anyway, what, what what's important today is this the, the, the people of sardinia have, 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 have fed fed up uh, we've had 35,000 hectares occupied by the military and we've had we've had these firing ranges uh, we're fed up with it it's a burden and and then of course there's there's the there's the, the the there's original sin that's being committed here. In fact, a, a CIA official has prepared some documents dating back to the sixties, and these were draft treaties, both which are supposed to link the USA and Italy. And you, and you should read what this CIA agent has 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 written. This document ended up in my hands. It, it Italy is just a big warship on the Mediterranean. It's uh, on on this big aircraft carrier. You 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 also have Sardinia. And, and 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 Sardinia, unlike Italy, doesn't have this b bothersome problem of people and and citizens. Sardinia is practically unpopulated, uh, and it, it's inhabited by very stubborn people, the Sardinians. But as is known, they're not capable of organising collective initiatives. So the island of Sardinia is poor. It's easy to buy for that reason, and and also the the air the military base will create hundreds of jobs which could be offered as a Bait. This is the translation from the American. It, this makes it easy to buy people. The jobs, uh, the, the local and regional jobs, are easy to use as uh, bait. So this is the original sin that was uh, that was com committed by the people that went into that, that entered into that contract. Anyway, I'd like to w wind up now by thanking Mr. Ujas and uh, Mr. Yelko Kachin, who've given us this opportunity to open the cage to bring this uh, problem of Sardinian slavery to Europe. Otherwise, there was a risk that the world would what, not know what was happening on Sard Sardinia. I am a Sardinian independent and I'm asking that those areas where 
weapons of war and cluster bombs are being tested and where those areas where depleted uranium are uh, depleted, that they be covered it by the uh, 2007 resolution which, which, cons which condemns the use of depleted uranium in war zones. It, the Italian state has subjugated the people of Sardinia, but now we're now going to Europe to ask for reimbursement and uh, damages, reimbursement for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the losses suffered and damages for the, the, the harm done. And we want the Italian state to, to provide other sources of employment for people living in this territory. And I think that Mr. Ujas, I'm sure, will pass on this message. So, uh, and, and this is a very good resolution, this one from the European Parliament from 2007. It's a fine text. Uh, I hope that uh, this, the, 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 these military exercise zones uh, will, will be included in that resolution because these are areas where depleted uranium has been used. Thank you very much, Bastiano Composto. Anticipo naturalmente che allegheremo agli atti il, la proposta. You read out a document there at the end. Uh, that can be part of uh, a parliamentary initiative. That's the first uh, step. You've been given the time to uh, set out your argument. Thank you for that. But could I now please invite all of you to be succinct? At some point, we'll have to uh, stop, and I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to speak. Federico Palomba, I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you for coming along. You are uh, an elected member of the uh, Italian Parliament from the region of Sardinia. I'll give you the floor, sir. Grazie della parola. Voglio innanzitutto. Thank you for giving me the floor. And let me start off by thanking the ALDE group in the European Parliament for organizing this. And thank you also to Mr. Ujas. Uh, on behalf of the Italian Partito dei Valori for organizing this very important event. It gives us an opportunity to convey the concern of our population uh, at what is happening. And we seek clarity. We ask for clarity. We would like for the, 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 the final say uh, to, to be said on this. We would like the military activity I in Sardinia to be looked into and to be settled. Uh, there's the south of Sardinia, there's La Quira, but also La Maddalena. There are various sites. 80% um, of the Italian military bases are to be found in Sardinia. I don't think any, anyone will envy us that. And I am trying to convey, as I said, the concerns which our citizens have in Sardinia. Uh, and together with another member of parliament, Mr. Stanislao, uh, who's doing good work I in the defense committee, but together with him, I have asked for urgent action. I've brought a motion for urgent action, and I've asked the government what they could do. And I want to look at the chain of command, uh, and I want to make sure that there was a clear chain of command for the activities carried out, and I want to make sure that the chain of command is led by Italians, because La Quira is an interforce base, so there are other nations that carry out activities there as well. And uh, our magistrates, the judiciary, uh, are carrying out an investigation, and they're asking at what level decisions were taken. 
in the chain of command because they need to try and attribute responsibility for certain of the operations uh, that took place. Now, the answer I got can be summarized into two aspects. It is said, first of all, that in a limited part of the territory, an, anomaly, an anomalous concentration of heavy metals was found. And people are still looking into that. And then there's a further unclear answer, which is worrying, uh, on the chain of command as well, in reply to the mo motion I brought together with uh, my friend, uh, the other member of parliament in Italy. Uh, and I'd like to reflect on this. I think, first of all, there's a concept of sovereignty, uh, which needs to be recalled. Even if there are agreements in place with other countries, the Italian state can not shirk their responsibility. They need to carry out continuous controls on all of the operations and activities that take place on the Italian territory. There needs to be responsibility for this somewhere. I sought reassurances uh, that these operations were led by uh, Italians. Uh, otherwise, it's difficult to attribute responsibility or liability. And we don't want to renounce our sovereignty. That's the second important point. Our citizens need to be involved. You cannot bypass the citizens when taking these type of decisions. Because the population, the citizens, are the ones that bear the brunt uh, of these operations. The third point I would make is that the work done by the magistrates, in our view, is very important. We need an independent authority to look at this. Finally, an independent authority in the form of the judiciary is looking into this, and they will be providing answers, hopefully reassuring answers to the extent possible for our citizens. And we see guarantees. Uh, and it's important for us to have guarantees. We've now brought this to the European level. And the two ME MEPs who've organized this activity, uh, in our view, should look at how the European Union can become active here so that we can be reassured further. Fourthly, we need to reduce the presence uh, in Sardinia of the military forces uh, and the pressure these military bases bring to bear. Maybe we should start thinking in terms of European defence. Maybe there is no longer a need for that. If you look at the war zones internationally, then Europe is not part of it, but our activities in Europe could be concentrated uh, in Sardinia. And yes, there are problems in organizing defense issues, but defense issues is no longer something for member states. I think we need to see it in a broader context. Uh, and that's the context of European defence. Now, from what others have said, it has become clear that they are concerned, that their electorates are concerned, and the hope has been expressed that certain of these military bases could be converted into something else. Uh, and that research could be uh, conducted there. I think that that is workable. 
And I think some of the tests need to be stopped straight away, certainly the explosions which lead to, to harmful effects for our population. Thank you, Mr. Palombo. Thanks for that uh, information. We will be taking careful note of everything you're saying. I'd like to pick up one of the points made uh, about the role of the EU, the role of the Commission. And perhaps I could refer to an oral question that I tabled uh, about data that's been collected, whether there's been correct data corrected, whether there's been a conflict of interest uh, um, and a conflict of interest for, for those people who were collecting and collating the information, the health authorities, the local authorities, there might have been some sort of conflict of interest there. And also I, I want to reflect on what the Commission can do. The uh, Commissioner John Daly, on behalf of the Commission, replied saying that uh, should, the, uh, should the situation develop further? Should the conditions in Quira outside the military site move to uh, the breach European laws protecting human health? The Commission would ask it to the Italian authorities for remedial action. So uh, there is a link between uh, what's happening in your, in your local area the, the, and national and international levels. Once once a certain limit is is uh, passed, then you can take matters to uh, to the higher level, and we can raise these matters in Europe. And here I'll give the and I'll give the floor to Monica Pisano, and then I'll ask uh, Isidoro Aiello to get ready. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ujes uh, for having invited us here. I'd like to also thank uh, um, all those who who have looked after us here. I thank, I thank you for your hospitality. My name is Monica Pisano. I am part of the Susan Tidu Committee. I come from a region that's never talked about. I come. I come from the Decimumano military base. There are about 450 flights a day, 450 to 500 flights, uh, planes taking off and landing because of because of what was happening in Libya. We become famous because of that, and we've got a, a lot of. Uh, fuel that's been leaking into our water table that's been happening for the last 20 years. And we've, we've complained, but no one has listened. But the most recent analyses that have been carried out, and, the, and that's because the military base is now mon monitoring the monitoring the uh, water table with piezometers, and we've been told that the levels of bean, benzene is three grams per litre, and benzene is, is the most one of the most dangerous uh, cancerogenous substances is known, and in the US uh, there was a national alarm in the 80s because of uh, spills of benzene, and the military base is, uh, is, 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 is trying to, to soak up and and absorb, reabsorb the benzene. But what's happening is that this some of this benzene is old and can't be hoovered up, and it and it, uh, it remains in the in the land. It's very difficult to get it out of the uh, water table. Water table, and it, stay, it will stay there for hundreds of years. Our mayor has come up with a, a decree to pro prohibited the use of wells but of course you know that farmers in the in the area you'll understand that people live in the area that people who live in remote uh, spots um, will, will carry on using these wells and this is a very this is an emergency for our zone earlier there was uh, there was talk of, of the media but our sardinian media uh, are guilty of a, a conspiracy of silence they only talk about uh, uh, about trying to stop us talking. They don't listen to us. Our complaints have been dealt with at the regional level. They've been dealt with at the regional health office. But we want answers. So I'll ask the honourable members how they're going to look after the health of Sardinian citizens because uh, we've been forgotten about. We're... 
uh, we're, but we are European citizens as well. Uh, and we are entitled to get these results in those areas where you've got the military bases and firing grounds. The, the, the tests are not carried out. The epi epidemiolo epi epidemiological studies are not being carried out. We demand to see the results of these tests. We are women and mothers who formed a group and we want to look after the health of our children. We want to look after the health of our families. Thank you very much. Yeah. Grazie Monica. Uh... Thank you, Monica. I'll send the text of my question, which is along those lines, and I'll also let you know what the Commission's uh, answer is. I'll give the floor now to Professor Isidore Aiello. Two minutes, please. If you speak for longer, then someone else won't have the opportunity to speak. So please stick to the allotted time. Uh, Giorgio Melis, please get ready to speak after the Professor. Uh... Epidemiology is a science, uh, and you can deduct from that any result you want. Unless you use very rigorous scientific uh, techniques. So of course, if epidemiological studies need to be carried out, then they need to be carried out by bodies which are qualified and that are independent and not in any way involved with the regional interests. That's the first point I would make. Secondly, then, the only way to resolve this problem of pollution in Quira, but also uh, elsewhere, because many sites are polluted, but the only way to get rid uh, of pollution is to avoid these explosions or things being burned. That's the only way of getting rid of these na nanoparticles. There are no other systems that can block uh, these particles. There are no filters that exist uh, which would uh, prevent these nanoparticles from being uh, uh, emitted, especially if they're smaller than 2.5 micro microns. The chemical industry is proposing certain uh, solutions with uh, filters, but they wouldn't work. Those are the two main points I wanted to make. You've given me two minutes, and I want to stick to that. So let me just stress one further fact, uh, and this picks up on a point made by someone who spoke be before me. Benzene uh, in certain areas in Italy uh, occurs f to the tune of 400,000 uh, times the level that is permitted. <laughs> Okay, Giorgio Lisi and the next speaker should get ready. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, everyone who's helped make this event a success. We needed to raise this issue in Europe. If you look at the interests at stake, and when there are large interests at stake, and when these issues are not dealt with properly, then we see this sort of vicious circle with different, different people getting involved, different, uh, uh, different interests are, are, are represented. Uh, we, we are accused of being uh, panic mongers, we're, we're, or, we're, uh, or we're being accused of denying the truth. But this, this isn't strange. This is uh, disinformation. We, this is this is this is just one way of having a dialogue. I'd like to point out that today, Mr. Ujas, at the end of each presentation, tried to sum up, tried to pick out the key words. And those who spoke before me put forward scientific points of view. They, they spoke very well, but it's enough to go onto the blogs and. And you'll see that some of the photos shown by Professor Gatti, uh, the, the, well, the, 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 these, these, these are photos that some people will say have been put there to frighten us, that people have used Photoshop to create those images. No, no, when, the big, when big interests are involved, the small people get frightened. But I'll try to use some of the key words that have emerged this afternoon. And I think that if if we can if we can steer this issue from the European level, 
and and I think that all interest groups had to be properly in, in, represented here. We we shouldn't just have the interests of of workers represented, but also the the, the rights of mothers should be uh, represented. Everyone has the right to live in a sustainable environment. And when we're talking about sustainability, uh, we're we're talking about sustainability for individuals. This isn't something abstract. Sustainability has to relate to a, a place and, and 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 to the people who live in that place. Let's look at some, some of the key words. Depleted uranium, full stop. And we're also talking about depleted democracy here. People, do, people have legitimate point of view, but they can't make themselves heard. That's depleted democracy. And then there is a battle between the different points of view. There's, there's a need to facilitate information, but the key words are no one denies... Uh, that, 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 that there's a right to health, but that right to health it, 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 it runs counter to the right to work. So there's a contradiction between the right to health and the right to work. But, sh but new technologies can be used to help reclaim the land, but, but no one should condone a, a technology that would lead to the death of even one person. We, we should only use technology that's been proved to be a harmless. Thank you, Giorgio. Very interesting, that view. Uh, it opens new angles. Viziente, which is the Sardinian version of the name Vincenzo. Uh, you have the floor. I'm Vincente Bianco. I work in Berlin on behalf of the Sardinian community. Uh, let me thank you warmly for having organized uh, today's event. For us uh, Sardinians, this is very important. It's important to be heard at European level. I simply wanted to say that uh, the issue of military slavery in Sardinia does weigh heavily on our territory and our hearts, but that's not the only problem we have. Uh, it's something that affects the areas around us as well. You have Teolado, Decimamano, Capofrasca, and all of the various other sites. Now, I heard uh, about the possibility to come here, that there was going to be an audience, and my heart filled with joy, but I was also a bit uh, reluctant, because what is happening in all of these sites is, is truly dramatic. But it's not just dramatic, it's also the result of how politicians manage the issue. And these were politicians that didn't listen to the Sardinian people and the Sardinian citizens. And I hope that this can now change for the future. I hope that this is only the start. This is the first of many meetings where we can be heard. Uh, and, uh, of course, we represent various diversities and we're united in our diversity. Grazie a te, Piziente. Sardinian uh, independentist. I'm, I'm a secular and uh, I'm in favour of a Sardinian republic. And I wanted to, to remind you of Rossella Uru. I think we should remember Rossella Uru. In prison, and let's hope she'll be freed uh, very soon. Well, you're talking about military slavery in uh, uh, in Sardinia. You can see this in various ways, in the political way, in the social, social as from the social point of view, from the legal point of view, from the historical point of view, from the health point of view. There are different... Uh, uh, there's this calls into question the way we live together. It calls into question uh, issues such as sovereignty and democracy. That's why dealing with uh, Capo San Lorenzo and the Quiru firing ground is very important. But these issues go, uh, are of emblematic importance, really. So we need to, to... I'm afraid the speaker is reading. I'm, I can't interpret. ...to the sue sfaccettature, quella che già Gramsci da Sardo definiva la questione, la questione sarda. La questione sarda. Una questione che fatica a entrare nell'agenda politica e mediatica italiana, ma che non di meno prima o poi dovrà essere affrontata. Tuttavia... 
su un piano più generale, quel che non viene mai messo in discussione è il principio secondo cui uno Stato possa legittimamente sottrarre una porzione di territorio ai suoi abitanti, ossia non le dimensioni e le opportunità di tale sottrazione o il suo prolungamento nel tempo, quanto precisamente il suo significato politico profondo. Significato che investe in pieno il concetto di sovranità e la sua applicazione pratica, nelle caratteristiche eccezioni di sovranità di stampo romantico, nazionalista, ottocentesco, giustificativa dell'approccio esclusivo di tipo top-down nelle scelte politiche di fondo. In tal senso, solo pochi in Sardegna, segnatamente nell'ambito indipendentista, pongono la questione in questi termini, eppure dovrebbe essere il modo principale della questione. Chi deve decidere se, come e quando limitare l'accesso alla fruizione del territorio sardo? Il fatto di appartenere politicamente all'Italia è un problema, un dato non suscettibile di indagine o discussione e una condizione storica analizzabile nel caso sostituibile con, diverse, con condizioni diverse? Si tiene poco conto, per esempio, del fattore geografico. Grazie, quasi mai... grazie Gianni. Il tempo è quasi, la... finito, quasi finito. Lo togli agli altri. Eh. Ma... No, il tempo è finito. Your time's up. You're taking time away from the others. <ride> Allora, si, si, si tiene poco conto, per esempio, del fattore geografico, quasi mai menzionato nei dibattiti in merito e anche di quello storico, ambiti di discussione problematici che potrebbero rimettere radicalmente in forza la scontata adesione della Sardegna all'ordinamento giuridico italiano. A che titolo, infatti, la Sardegna può essere identificata come una porzione del territorio italiano, dunque assoggettata agli interessi collettivi, posti che questi di cui si parla lo siano, rappresentati dallo Stato italiano o addirittura interessi diversi, internazionali o di altri Stati, o addirittura privati? Grazie, I Sardi il Sardo dovrebbe avere voce in capitolo. Una questione sono. Questi interrogativi non investono una sfera di significati che sta al di sopra del tema socio-sanitario specifico e ne investe venendo altri, ma è ineludibile, specialmente in un momento di crisi in cui risulta più evidente che in passato, come i problemi strutturali della Sardegna, non abbiano né possano avere la sede della risoluzione per le istituzioni rappresentative della sovranità statale italiana. Grazie. Paola Sidi. Thank you. We'll hear from Paola Sidi. You're reading at such a speed that the interpreters can't keep up, and frankly, anyone listening in Italian probably hasn't understood either. Paola, your turn. Thank you very much. I'm part of the committee uh, called Sojasso, but I, I'm also a civilian victim. I've brought along my dormant tumour. Over the past years, I've seen people get uh, ill, and die as a result, but I've really not come across anyone who's shown a real interest in protecting our citizens. Of course, I've also seen soldiers who uh, were ill, and as Mr. Cabido said earlier, it would seem from the registers of tumours from our area, from our region, that the, the averages aren't... Uh, above the national averages. But I've been in and out of hospital for many years now, uh, and I could tell you that if I were to draw up my own register of tumours, you would find a very, very different truth. It's not just the people from Cagliari that go to the hospitals in Cagliari. They go to Nuora, Sassari, Olbia, uh, and you have the small islands, Carlo Forte, La Maddalena. I know people from La Maddalena who come to our hospitals as well. And what I don't understand is how people can continue to say that the figures don't add up, that there aren't all of these ill people. And I'm talking about soldiers and civilians alike. We're talking about employment and jobs and that that needs to be protected, fair enough. But if someone is ill, I used to work, I was a hairdresser, I got ill, I'm still not cured. And if, if I were to recover, I'll have to go back to work, what am I going to do? Be a hairdresser? For who? For those who no longer have hair because they're under chemotherapy? I, I wrote down a question. Mr. Ujas, well, I'll start off by thanking everyone for organizing this event, but Mr. Ujas, how are you planning on protecting the rights of the ill citizens who live around uh, the firing range? Because it's impossible for those people to carry out the easiest tasks in life and their rights are not being recognized. So that's my question. Thank you.
Grazie per l'intervento, ti, ti rispondo. Thank you very much. I'll answer in a moment. And now I'll give the floor to Simone Gualbu and then Pino Casu should get ready. Sono Simone Gualbu, sono il presidente. I represent a, a collective, Noyo Rastro. I am here to represent the the stock breeders and the shepherds and the stock breeders who have been affected by the firing range of Quira. The stock breeders are the first who want to work in safe conditions and who want to be able to produce safe food. But uh, today, after all the media attention, after all the, uh, after all the in investigations, we still haven't got clarity. We still don't know uh, what the situation is as regards our health. We don't know which part of the firing range is polluted. We don't know which part is clean. The only thing we're uh, sure is that the samples uh, t taken uh, from, from, from our stock are, are, are safe. And as the samples taken from our produce are safe. But, but there's, still un there's still uncertainty. We're not certain uh, whether the firing range is harmful, or whether it's harming us. The only thing we know is that our stock breeders, our farmers, ha have been ruined. Why? Well, because of all this um, media attention, the only result that we've had is that uh, military exercises are still going on. Uh, and, of course, it's right that that should be the case at the moment. But the farmers, the stock breeders, can't do their job. They can't work. That's what we see today. As I was uh, saying at the beginning, if, if, we, if we want some, somewhere to live and if we want to have health for the public at large, if we want to have a safe place to live, if we want to have jobs... And if we, we, if we discover that the, that the activities of the firing range are health harmful, then the firing range has to, to, to be shut down. But there's, it's been this media campaign, and all we know is, is that we've destroyed the, the economy of the entire region in our efforts to protect our health. We've destroyed the economy. Thank you. It's a bit complicated. I have to substitute a little bit the Honorable Uja. I'll be replacing Mr. Ujas for a, a few minutes. I'm not sure who is next because the notes are difficult to lose. Yes, I, I'm Pino. I'm over here. I'm just a citizen. I don't belong to any association. I, I'm a Sardinian uh, uh, from uh, Cagliari, but I've been living in Belgium for a long time now. I'd like to make a few comments and then I'd like to finish off with a question and I hope to stick to the two minutes, a lot of two me, even though that's difficult. Now, I came along today uh, having a vague knowledge of Quira and what was going on there and all of these nano uh, particles. Uh, and what I say might be imprecise, I might say some things which aren't entirely correct. But in a very short period of time, I have learned a, a, a lot in scientific terms from Mrs. Gatti, but also in political terms from other speakers. And I think we can take it as read that there is a problem. If you listen to what Mrs. Gatti in particular has said, and if you've listened to what the others have said, then I think it's pretty clear we have a problem. Uh, I think Mr. Stanislaw uh, put it in political uh, terms. So the situation has been clarified. There are no longer any doubts that there is a problem. And then after it, there were further interventions which tried to call this into question and doubts were raised. But I think we're trying to call into question something which is pretty evident. We can take it as read. So now that we know that there is a problem, what we need to do is do what Mr. Di Stanislao said, uh, which is to dissociate the political discourse from the social discourse. Now, you've raised awareness in my head. We can raise awareness amongst others from a political point of view and a scientific point of view and from a trade union point of view. Me. Mr. Fanny, who spoke on behalf of Chisel, the Italian trade union, uh, well, I have a great deal of admiration for what you do uh, and what you do to create jobs and to maintain jobs and you're trying to recover the Quira 
test site. It's not just a problem of Quira, of Sardinia or Italy. This is a European and global problem. Uh, and I think we need to raise awareness uh, of these problems, the, this pollution that nanotechnologies bring about. And Mrs. Gatti was very clear in her presentation. So, so these are my comments, uh, in a nutshell. And I would come to my question. Mr. Fanny, the trade unionist, it's a question for you and possibly also for the representative of the Oljastra province. And I hope you can give me a specific answer. You talk about reclaiming the territory, recycling it. What do you mean by that? And what do you hope to uh, achieve in terms of the impact o o on the economy and on employment? If Quira disappears, what are, what are you hoping comes in its stead? And uh, to the lady from La Maddalena, you, you told us that Esmeralda, the US Navy base, is gone. But what has that meant to La Maddalena as an archipelago in terms of uh, employment? There's employment and economic development, but there's also health, which needs to look at. And the most important thing is health and war, first and foremost. Uh, health and, and, and peace, first and foremost. Paola Francione. Let's uh, give the floor to those who are on the speaker's list. Paola Francione, good evening. I'm part of of the Sujas Committee of Villa Puzzo. For years, we've been collecting information. Gradually, we realized what was happening in our area. There were rumors, uh, and, and we realized that over all these years, the uh, local administrations, the local health authorities were just covering things up. And sometimes there was there was actually a disinformation campaign. There were checks to see whether there was arsenic there. There were checks to see if various materials were in the ground. But but the situation is much more complex than it seemed at the beginning. But people have taken sides. There's been a sort of a polarization, really. Uh, people have talked about de de the democratic deficit. Some people have talked about using the precautionary principle. Others have talked about transparency. But as far as we're concerned, these are jobs that, that have been provided. Well, then they're not very. They're not decent jobs. That they're not l long term jobs. That. that um, there's no, there are no career prospects. Of course, then there's the situation of the shepherds, who, uh, who've been working and, gr and grazing in areas where where they didn't really have a license to do so. So they p won't get any uh, damages if damages are, are eventually paid. These these are shepherds are not even officially recognised. But anyway, there, there are all sorts of different layers. Uh, there, there's tension, uh, there's polarisation. So whatever solution is proposed, uh, and whatever the the Oliastra province is suggesting, should be discussed with the grassroots discuss with the people because there are different uh, experts uh, there are lots of there's lots of knowledge there's lots of expertise that should be tapped and we need to get people together around a table so that they can discuss these things and and people should be able to propose solutions uh, i think that that, that what, the, the, the round table is is one solution there are other possible solutions people should should be able to get together in the local area now we're, t we're 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 at the European level. No, we're in a place where you can express your views. No one's going to t tell you to be quiet. No one's going to accuse you of anything. Uh, you can you can speak freely here, says the Mr. Ujas. Yes, yes. Sir. There's another point that I wanted to make very quickly. No, I have to give the floor to somebody else. Scusa, non posso far parlare un'altra persona. Una cosa sola. Sì, Nonostante la situazione, la ci sono le esercitazioni in corso. Nonostante questo quadro drammatico. 
The military exercises are still going on. Despite this dramatic situation, the military exercises are still going on. What's the, what's the precautionary principle that's being used there? Allora, Paul de Neyer. Paul de Neyer. Paul de Neyer, je suis instituteur Bruxelles. Thank you, I'm from Brussels. I don't really know Sardinia all that well. I've never been there. But I'm a sympathizer of the Sardinian people and their cause. So I empathize a great deal. I was studying history and that's when I heard about Sardinia first. And I noticed that if you compare Sardinia to other places in Europe, it's Milan. Il y avait the place with the most holy wells. There are thousands of them. If you look on internet and research it, then those wells are, 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 are brilliant. And it's a pity to hear that this is now being destroyed. What kind of benefits could the, the, the Sards have from the presence of these military bases like Quira? It's corrupting the water table. They've got uh, uh, calcium and, and the lime soil. If you're going to pollute it, how are you going to get rid of the pollution? Especially if heavy metals are polluting it and nanoparticles are. The, the, the soil is going to be rotten. Uh, and I fear that... Kira's future and Sardinia's future is bleak. You see this image of greenhouses where crops will have to be grown and fodder will have to be produced for animals. That's a nightmare. I don't know who has put this forward as the future for your region, but even that won't be possible. Where are you going to find the water? You'd have to decontaminate seawater because you can't take it out of your soil because it will be full of heavy metals. Uh, what I've heard today will not uh, allay my fears for and my concerns for Sardinia. Okay, we'll give the floor now uh, to Professor Gatti, as I promised, and then uh, to another speaker. Well, could could I show you? Could I see the last slide again, please? I showed you uh, some some invisible uh, bullet bullets. Uh, sorry, some. Uh, I mean, this is certified documentation. All these biological tissues uh, have been tested by research institutes. This material is certified. If, if you use the technology that I have, then you can get this data. You, this the data I've given you today is beyond doubt. And it could well be. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the picture I wanted. All, all, all this dust is, is, is being created in the environment. And. Uh, We've been trying to stop this. We've been, it's, it's only by trying to stop this dropout, this fallout. It's only by trying to stop this nuclear f f fallout that we can uh, can can we can reclaim the area. But, but I'm I'm suggesting that we build these greenhouses so that we can grow the fodder that uh, the the animals need. But the only way. Uh, to, to, to do this is to use hydroponics. This is the future. It's not just me saying this. It's the whole world. You can, you, you. I can sh I'll show you. I'll show you the next slide. You have. Uh, you can grow the, the lettuce uh, or, or the fodder on various levels in two days. I can provide you with uh, fodder, safe fodder for your animals, and you can add nutrients and uh, vitamins. But then, if you the the meat that I will get from these animals will be of high quality. So now that, that a, an economy, a local economy, has been destroyed, you can um, recover from that. You can produce goods that are 
safe, certifiably safe. There are steps that can be taken. Show me the last slide. But then there's another possibility, an extra possibility, another way of running your economy. You can put solar panels on the top of your greenhouses, and then that way you can generate electricity. So my, or generate energy, my proposal is, uh, my, my proposed solution, the way to get out of this natural disaster, because there are shepherds who don't know how to feed their animals. And, and I think that, I don't think they're going to be able to, gra to have their animals grazing, but uh, their sort of livelihood is unsustainable in the modern world anyway. I think we've got to find uh, some sort of solution that will allow the local economy to to grow again. I think the, the economy of Quira could be based on living side by side with the, with the military, but there are other solutions as well. You can uh, overcome your difficulties. So this is just a proposal, it's just an idea. But I wanted to leave with you some food for thought, really, because it's only by thinking that you can, and reflecting that you can get out of a situation like this. Thank you, Madam Gatti. We'll hear from Mr. Katchin. Then we'll see whether we have some more time. If they don't uh, force us out of the room, we might stay on. Uh, I don't have my own personal experience with Sardinia, but I wanted to say is the fact that military polygons, military shooting areas, military training areas are always in, a pl in a places that are difficult for people to live. Otherwise, people would live there for centuries. So they are always using, let's say, empty space. But the fact is that military presence all around Europe is going to be reduced uh, through the process of professionalization of the armies. There will be less and less military, and it will be less and less opportunities to get incomes and to create growth in local communities on a basis of military presence. This is a fact, and this needs to be taken into account. When I was flying for the last time over Corsica and Sardinia, it looked like Alps. Everything was white and snow. This year was unique in the history of Mediterranean, including the African part, because it was snowing in Tunisia and Libya as well. But what we are creating, what we have organized today, is something about Europe. Europe simply need to be, and European Union, first of all, need to be a little bit more than it was before. It need to be very much about solidarity as well, as well. What I have learned today is that despite you are saying that Ireland is almost empty and that people emigrated and so on, but you still have extremely strong local identity. And this is what deserves to be offered to the people that are traveling around. This is the main advantage, a very strong local identity, what makes you unique and different from the other Italians. That is what is interesting. This is what younger generation would say is sexy for the time being. These deserve to be learned, to see, and to pay a visit. So what I would like to say as a conclusion is that Sardinia deserves ecological and social rehabilitation. The end of military presence always uh, creates a very difficult situation and needs to be cleaned up. And this is costly, and this takes time. But you need to insist on that because you deserve a compensation for such a long military presence. And uh, the question is, what is the alternative for the military presence? I would say only development and new jobs, not just services, but also production. You know, British economy is just about services, but this is not the future. 
Those who are doing the best these days are Germans who produce something, who export something. And that's why foreign investments are needed. When I'm saying foreign investments, I mean Italian and other investments, because there, it is evident that there is not enough capital for investments and development on the, on the island. Uh, I will just conclude by saying, somebody mentioned that, Sardinia, that Italy is a huge aircraft carrier, old state, and the boot, and Sardinia as well. So it's time to upgrade it and to update to a huge tourist cruiser. I would say this is the first solution. This is accessible. This can be achieved in a quite a short period of time. But first of all, you need to be ambitious and you need to promote yourself. Show up. This is what is needed. You need to be attractive, visible, not by demonstrations, but to creating better opportunities to spend a free time. Uh, quality for Europeans maybe means to pay a visit in Sardinia and for you to earn some more money. This is what I would advise. Thank you. Thank you, Yelko. I think he's just earned himself an invitation to Sardinia for uh, next summer. Roberto, Maria Pia, uh, were addressed by those questions, so I'll happily give you the floor. Yes, please go ahead. I'll be brief. I'd just like to come back to your question, sir. Uh, what uh, is left now that the Americans have left? Well, we have a very difficult economic situation. It's quite disastrous. Unemployment has gone up. And we hope that we can convert the archipelago from a military base into a tourist destination. But, uh, of course, my administration, uh, of course, is of the opinion that the interests of, of the military shouldn't outweigh our uh, interests. If you look at Santo Stefano, a part of the archipelago where the US Navy base is located. Uh, and if you then see that for 30 years, none of the Sardinians could go there. Uh, and if you now know that the Italian Navy wants to take that base over, then it, it's quite uh, worrying. So we've gone to the courts to change this decision. Uh, we won our case. The President Capellacci, uh, the president of our region, is nowhere to be seen, of course, but that was quite a historic victory in the courts for everyone involved in this, the people from La Maddalena, the Sardinians, uh, and for anyone in Italy who is a subject of military slavery. Uh, through this court case, we said, enough, we've had enough of these centralist decisions which are imposed on us, it's time to give the local communities a voice. C'è da dire che ancora uh, in termini di posti di lavoro, di numeri di posti di lavoro, penso che, magari poi mi corregge il segretario della CISL, siamo intorno a, ai, mille, ai mille dipendenti. E, oltre a questi mille dipendenti c'è oh, tutto un mondo agricolo, un mondo agricolo che, eh, che lavora, che che ne trae appunto risorse per poter andare avanti dalle, dalle aree limitrofe al, al poligono. Oh, la mia proposta, quella che ho fatto prima e forse non è stata uh, recepita bene, era quella di un'evoluzione del poligono, prevedere un'evoluzione del poligono, un poligono sicuro e soprattutto un poligono controllato. Poi bisognerebbe ve vedere, aprire un ragionamento su chi dovrebbero essere questi controllori. Ecco. Eh, 
un poligono sicuro, dicevo, rispettoso dell'ambiente in cui è prevista appunto anche la presenza degli agricoltori, degli allevatori che ci sono adesso e che in questa fase si sono visti doppiamente danneggiati. In primis perché loro hanno perso il, il, ter il territorio che hanno sempre conosciuto e poi successivamente eh, eh, hanno perso perché sono stati appunto cacciati dal territorio in cui hanno sempre operato e poi in, in un secondo momento perché non, non vi possono rientrare ecco. quindi c'è una situazione di, di confusione totale e speriamo che questi grossi punti interrogativi che ci sono ancora che vengano una volta per tutte affrontati e, e, e discussi e, e in modo tale da avere una chiar la chiarezza assoluta diciamo, sul poligono di Quirra, grazie Grazie a te. Permettetemi, permettetemi pochi minuti per concludere io. Tra un po'... Tra, Raffaella Zonchedu, ti tolgo un minuto dal mio intervento. Solo una piccola riflessione. Probabilmente la risposta è davanti a tutti noi per il fatto che le, istituzio le istituzioni italiane non abbiano ancora risolto questo problema e penso che dovremmo riflettere a quanto perderebbe il governo italiano come introito chiudendo le nostre basi militari in Sardegna ah, Grazie Raffaella, ti do un dato che mi è stato riferito oggi l'utilizzo della base del poligono di Quirra costa 50.000 euro l'ora l'ora per i privati allora, noi ci troviamo purtroppo davanti ad un dilemma vecchio quanto la civiltà moderna, diciamo. Prima non si aveva questo problema. Lavoro contro salute, ambiente contro, oh, oh, contro persone. È una uh, situazione di contrapposizione che non è accettabile nel momento in cui si trovano soluzioni per tutto. Noi dobbiamo uscire da questo dilemma. È ed è una cosa che non è accettabile. Ricordo un'altra situazione italiana che si svolgeva su, lungo un fiume che si chiama Cengio, riguardava una fabbrica che si chiamava Acna. Questo, questa fabbrica era posta a monte di un, eh, di, di un, di un fiume e c'era una città, adesso non ricordo quale fosse, comunque sempre in Liguria, dove c'era una fabbrica che produceva vernici e voleva lavorare. A valle c'era un'altra città lungo lo stesso fiume che recepiva gli scarti che venivano immessi sul fiume e c'era una presenza di malattie e di tumori enorme all'interno di questa altra città, di questo altro paese. Ed erano un paese contro l'altro, salute contro lavoro. Noi non possiamo accettare questo tipo di situazione. Allora, per non enfatizzare il discorso, dico semplicemente che tra le competenze della eh, Unione Europea, esattamente all'articolo 168 del trattato, c'è eh, la eh, Unione Europea che deve essere indirizza la sua azione eh, al miglioramento della sanità pubblica, alla prevenzione delle malattie e delle affezioni e alla eliminazione delle fonti di pericolo per la salute fisica e mentale. Quindi c'è un compito istituzionale che è in capo alla comunità europea, alle istituzioni europee, che fa anche da, da pai ad un altro compito, che è quello che... Eh, eh, fa riferimento a un principio che si applica in tutta la comunità europea, cioè chi inquina paga. Allora, chi è che ha creato questo genere di situazioni in questo territorio? È stato lo Stato italiano? Sono stati i comandi interforze che hanno oh, creato questa situazione? Credo che la prima cosa da fare sia accertare questo. E accertare se è vero che continuano le esercitazioni, che cosa comunque in questo momento viene utilizzato in queste esercitazioni. Perché banalmente quando uno utilizza un bene 
si verifica lo stato precedente e si verifica lo stato successivo. Quando prende una macchina a noleggio gli viene verificato che non ci sono graffi nella carrozzeria e quando la riconsegna che non ci sono ugualmente graffi nella carrozzeria. Se ci sono li paga, paga la riparazione. Allora in questo caso anche se si chiama Stato, anche se si chiamano forze armate devono essere chiamati a pagare questo tipo di, di conseguenze. E credo che insieme alle parole che sono state pronunciate oggi, non tanto in quanto parole, quanto in, ca in quanto capisaldi di un ragionamento, noi costruiremo una proposta tutti insieme, partendo dal basso fino ad arrivare a tutti i livelli istituzionali, perché oggi sono presenti, e li ringrazio, il livello istituzionale europeo, quello nazionale, eh, quello, quello, quello provinciale, le categorie sociali, i soggetti che comunque hanno voce in capitolo su questa cosa, i movimenti, la gente, su questo per costruire un, un percorso. Eh, può arrivare alla chiusura del poligono oh, in termini eh, non militari, eh, può arrivare attraverso un altro percorso di creazione di un sistema alternativo come diceva Roberto Cabidu noi però non possiamo accettare che rimanga lo status quo, che rimanga la situazione così come è adesso perché quella guerra tra lavoro e salute nel 2012 non è concepibile, penso che questo sia l'obiettivo dal quale dobbiamo partire per il futuro, per altre iniziative che non finiscono qua, grazie a tutti per la partecipazione